The mundane world you know is a lie, fraying at the edges. Follow the echoes of Metropolis. Chase the truth to its source and ascend. You are entering White Walls, a chronicle about Mage the Ascension and Cult Divinity Loss. Due to adult language and the violent nature and intense horror themes of our tale of terror and damnation, we encourage listener discretion. Welcome to Morple Tales, where we play terrifying tales and awesome adventures every day of the week. If it's the dark and scary that calls to you, we have Kimchi's Grimdark Chronicles on Thursdays and Deviant the Renegades on Saturdays. If it's a bit of sci-fi intrigue that you fancy, we have Cyberpunk Red on Mondays and Tales from the Loop on Wednesdays. And if it's fantasy you crave, we have Scarred on Fridays. Be sure to check out our website, MorbleTales.com, to see our complete calendar, see recaps of shows, and get the links to our past archive of shows on YouTube. Starting later this month, podcast links. You will also find links to all our social media here and our Patreon. Be sure to click follow on Twitch so you can get notified of shows, and if you check out the YouTube archive, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell. All new and current Twitch followers will be entered into a drawing for a free PDF of any of our past games once we hit 300 followers on Twitch. Special thanks to Onyx Path Publishing and White Wolf for gifting us the World of Darkness and all the support they offer. Thanks to Helm Gas and Modivius for gifting us the newest version of Cult Divinity Lost. To Astral Tabletop for the awesome virtual space we used to play all our games. And to at NH Mid for from right here at Warple Tales for our custom Astral Tabletop Mage character sheets that you all can use too if you play Mage on Astral Tabletop. Thanks to Dark Somnia Music, Darren Curtis Music, and Savk Music for providing some of the sounds you'll hear in this chronicle, as well as Helm Gas for letting us use the Divinity Original Sin soundtrack. Links to all of these awesome people will appear in chat momentarily. Awaken Seekers of Enlightenment. Tell us who you are, as well as the first name of your character in this chronicle. Hello, everybody. I am Steve. You can find me on the internet struggling with hand wraps at Voodoo Arcade. And uh, tonight I will be playing Drake. Sorry, did you say Drake? Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, I'm good. Drake, I'm good. Drake, Drake Jones, if you wanted his last name. Oh, okay. I yeah. Okay. Hey everybody, I'm Ever. My pronouns are they them. You can find me all over the internet as Changeling Ever. And tonight I will be playing Gabriel Hargrave, who is well. I lost for words. Sorry. <laughs> the end. Hi, I'm Erica. You can find me at Moron Recluse on Twitter, and tonight I'll be playing Jose Vega, the Catholic priest and member of the Celestial Chorus. Hey, my name is Rachel. You can find me, Stolen Fires, pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, but not a Stolen Fires. That's my real name, Rachel. Uh, and I will be playing a hollow one inspired by my handle, so she's very uh, Promethean Luciferian. Uh, I'm Harry, aka the Slippery Cat, and I am playing David. He is a uh, an Order of Hermes uh, douchebag, so should be fun. Hello, um, my name is Jared, and I'll be playing Leo today. Uh, he is a dream speaker, and yeah, animals and shit. Dream speaker. Animals and shit. All right. Okay. So, just to touch base with the players, we are keeping the same chronicler and recap reader as in previous games. So that would be not me. I was I was hoping you'd remember. It's ever. Ever's the reader, but not the writer. Is it is Eric? Was it you taking writer notes for this one? That would be. I thought it was I think ever. Ever was both. recording and Steve was. I narrating. I started recap. off as narrator, but um, it got moved to not me. I think I will ask Rachel to take notes in this one because Rachel has the most experience with the classic world of darkness, probably second only to Harry. From the rest of you, that it's way the rest of you can pay attention as you learn rules. <laughs> I mean, if you're good with that, Rachel. Rachel. Wait, did you say I'll, second only to me? Because Rachel knows way more about World of Darkness than I I'll do. I'll throw down with Harry on. on no, this Rachel can contest. smoke me on World of Darkness. Are you kidding? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, obviously, we don't have a recap this session, so we're going to move right on to entering Elysium, where in session prologue, we're going to talk about Mage, and then actually, hopefully, get into some play by the end of the night. So, first thing I'm going to point out to those of you who have played Mage with us before or watched it with us before when we did Technocracy Reloaded, uh, we did a two... Point two five session zero to two full sessions and a little bit of a third because in order to do technocracy reloaded I had to teach a bunch of people who never played mage 20 years of metagame this has no metagame no history lesson all that's thrown out for those of you who saw that last time I don't like it uh, this will however be a more structured world than those of you who played mage with me previously before there was full details The way this will work is this chronicle, we will refer to each episode as a chapter. So if you hear the word chapter, that means the session. If you hear the word book, that means the closed arc, the season, the 8 to 12 sessions it takes to tell this part of the story. The books combine to create the chronicle, which will have a minimum, depending on your actions, of 10 books. So it's going to run a while. Between each book, we will take a short break to play Call of Cthulhu, one or two shots, Colt, one or two shots, and Delta Green, one or two shots. It's the air fist pump. And then we will be returning to the Chronicle. That's how it will work. Questions on that? Okay. So, as many people are probably dying to know who saw us talk about a crossover, how's that going to work? So we're going to talk about the themes of Mage of the Ascension, 20th Anniversary Edition. And we're going to talk about the themes of Cult Divinity Lost. And then we're going to talk about the themes of Through the Mythos. And how we're going to mush them all into one happy ball of bread dough. That's full right. of carbs. But no gluten, just carbs. I appreciate that. <laughs> Same. Mage uh, has we, two positive can, can themes. Can I just have their gluten? Yes. I'll put all of their gluten into your ball of dough. Thank you. So uh, Mage has two positive themes hope and change with the mood of defiance and reflection from the book Mage 20th Anniversary Edition should anyone be curious wonderful glorious 900 page tome of awesomeness so above all other things Mage has games about giving a name while other hope folks are hopeless or content enough to accept that they've been given Mages appear to change the picture in the world of darkness they disagree, often violently, about what the picture should look like, but they are not apathetic. Mages also are power. What you will, will be. That power can go to your heads, corrupt you, demolish everything you hold dear, but it's there. So, the dominant theme of a mage game is typically a hope. Things might get bad, even tragic, but the possibility of change never goes away. That element of transformation becomes the second theme in mage. Nothing is set in stone, everything changes. Stasis in a mage game is the enemy. The mood of defiance and reflection? Life sucks, so fix it. Whether you're playing a desperate street kid and enlightened CEO, a kung fu hero, or a classy sorcerer, your world seems intent on fucking you over. That said, uh, a mage has the power to fight back. That said, be careful. In fighting back, you can become part of the problem, or your power can eat you alive themes of uh, Dark Mage and now we're jumping to Book of the Fallen the themes of the villains, the super villains the extra deluxe true story ending villains in this game will be predation, abuse, horror, evil compassion um so the core ethos of the supervillains you will be facing is eat or be eaten in every literal sense of the word. Everyone and everything is on the menu. The difference is how far up the menu are you? Where's your position on the food chain? Uh, abuse as a metaphor and a theme and a game that uses the finding typically comes up. So to touch on that briefly, uh, none of that will happen. In detail. If it does come up, it'll be fade to black. So it'll be working. 
that's all they have to worry about with that. Uh, but to define abuse, a systemic pattern of dependence, isolation, exploitation, threats, damage, and fear. Thus is how the Nefandi work as a supervillain. Uh, Nefandi, so anyone can commit evil. The fallen embrace evil. They do evil because they want to, to achieve an end goal of utter annihilation and destruction. So there will be themes of you guys being tempted by dark powers, but none of you should fall to actual, should actually fall, big capital F. Little F, yes. If your characters decide to follow that arc, it's compelling and it's good drama. However, when that final piece happens and you become the bandits and enter a call, your character's done. You become super villain. So get that out of the way ahead of time, too. You won't get to roleplay being someone who does evil because they like it. That's gross. <laughs> um, shoot on sight. Horror. Uh, probably don't really need to uh, touch on that too much, but uh, as a theme, fear is used to galvanize mages. Mages react to fear by throwing their power around. So when, you, when a a normal person gets afraid, they might punch, shoot, stab, run, scream. When you guys get afraid, uh, you might accidentally transform an entire city into Victorian England, then set it on fire, and then send it back to the madness. Fear is a much larger consequence for your level of power. Be aware of that, too. Okay. Those are the themes of Mage of the Ascension. Cult. Divinity Lost. I think all of you here, except maybe Harry, has played that at least once. So, uh, I will... Cult... It's easier to read the intro fluff to their books than it is to, uh... Sorry, I'm looking for Talk about direct themes in Cult. So, from the Cult Divinity Lost book, I'm going to read you the setting fluff. You live in a world where the sun has set. Forsaken creatures roam deserted streets in crumbling cities. Fallen angels mourning their creator seek shelter in abandoned cathedrals of steel and rust. Behind silent facades, skyscrapers, people in designer clothes strap their victims to cold autopsy tables. Forbidden rituals are woven with human blood and terror. Mangled bodies are taken away in plastic bags to disappear forever. Secret words are spoken by death magicians over cheap bourbon in run-down bars. In abandoned buildings, children of the night sell demons in bottles for Estee Lauder. Forgotten gods are revived by the neon lights and the street noise and tread their dance of death, trendy close. Every crossing, every rickety staircase, every doorway could lead to unknown worlds, literally. You are imprisoned in the borderlands of darkness and madness, of dreams and death. A veil has been placed over your eyes, masking the truth and keeping the divinity of your souls asleep. In the labyrinth of Elysium, the prophets of your age begin their journey towards awakening. You live in a world where the sun has set, where your divinity is lost, and where death is only the beginning. Um, to quickly touch on cult, we'll get much deeper into this as the story progresses. But the bottom line of the cult world is, at one point in history, a divine entity called the Demiurge kicked humanity out of the golden city of Metropolis, where we were ascended as gods. No one knows why. Just did. He invaded the wild, or Gaia, and created a place there called Elysium to trap us in an illusion. And then, to seal the illusion in, he sent his angels and their servants, the lictors, the jailkeepers, to entrap you even deeper in a never-ending spiral of guilt and sin and consumption and all the lies that trap you in mundane reality. And then, after a bunch of time passes, the Demiurge disappears. No one knows why, but he's gone. God is gone. God is dead. You decide. And in his place, his entire hierarchy of systems I should say its place. Its entire hier hierarchy of systems has been thrown into utter disarray. The angels are infighting, and their dark reflections, the demonic overlords, are becoming ascendant, rampaging and running free now that there's no more God to stop them. So the illusion phrase at the edges of people need to see through it. 
However, most of the time reclaiming your lost divinity will drive you mad. Or turn you into something worse. Thus is how cult works. So, uh, that's themes. As a rule set, cult, basically, a character has an archetype. So as you can see, that merges really easily with the world of darkness. They have disadvantages and advantages, which is why you are all more overloaded than normal with merits and flaws. And they all have a dark secret attached to the character, which is why you all have that flaw, much nastier than the normal version. This is how you merge that feeling into the world of darkness, not just the fluff in the setting. Also, cult's magic works differently than yours. So you will have access to it. You will have the ability to learn it at a high price. But it is very different than spear magic. It's very, very much more focused. It can only do a few things, but it does them at a much higher power level and without the cost of paradox that your magic does. So you trade versatility for extreme focus. Also, typical cult magic is all ritual-based. Nothing can be done on the fly, really. Cthulhu Mythos. Cthulhu Mythos has a bunch of themes. We're tossing out the gross ones, like Fear of the Other, none of that. So I will talk about the ones we're keeping. The fear and awe you feel when confronted by phenomena beyond your comprehension whose scope extends beyond the narrow field of human affairs and boasts cosmic significance. Being real tiny in a big universe that doesn't care about you. A contemplation of mankind's place in the vast comfortless universe revealed by modern science, in which the horror springs from the discovery of truth through machines. Third, a naturalistic fusion of horror and science fiction in which presumptions about the nature of reality are eroded. That sounds a lot like cult. Those mesh nicely. Preoccupation with viscerate texture. Lovecraft's horror doesn't typically tend to be blood, bones, corpses, and nails. It tends to be semi-gelatinous substances, transmorphic substances, slimes, and tentacles. Helplessness and hopelessness. Lovecraftian heroes may cut a deal setbacks to malignant forces, but the victories tend to be temporary and usually with a high price. And often, the investigators die. Unanswered questions. Characters in Lovecraft stories rarely, if ever, fully understand what's happening to them and often go insane if they try to figure it out. And last but not least, sanities, fragility, and vulnerability. Characters in many of Lovecraft's stories are unable to cope mentally with the incomprehensible truths they witness. So, fun new custom rules to see how we merge this mechanically beyond a few extra spheres of magic from cults. We talked about this a little bit in the chat room. We're gonna go over it here so everyone has a chance to really understand it. We will be adding five new stats to your characters, four of which are just uh, re-sleeving existing concepts from Vampire the Masquerade, and one of which is brand new. Starting with the brand new one, you will all have an awareness trait. You can put it on your character sheets anywhere you want, if I haven't already. Awareness has a maximum of 10 dots. Awareness is a rating of your awareness of the truth seen through the illusion. Yes, Steven. Doesn't awareness already exist in this game? No. Not as a stat. Oh. It's in abilities. Under talents. Yeah, that means I probably put it in there for you. Okay. Okay. I thought that was the... Okay. Well, you're talking about a skill. Like, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's under that's talents. not the same as... That's not the same as... That's correct. We'll get to that when we talk about abilities. Okay. This is like a willpower level stat. It should be at the bottom of your sheet. If I didn't add it, you can just find a place for it at the bottom left where you have all those extra spaces. Or on page two. Also, that awesome notes thing Astral has can be used for such stuff as this. The notes page on Astral is, is pretty not dope. Dopeness. Yeah. Your awareness all begins at one because your mages, you are awakened. You must begin at zero. Right? So, 
So awareness, come, we start at one for awareness, correct? Yep. Sure, okay. Awareness increases as you interact with things related to, and these are outer realms, not earthly realms. Inferno, the abyss, the outer void, the labyrinth, the deep umbra, other realms beyond physical earth. This will not increase if you interact with uh, Metropolis or uh, Elysium, which is what your normal world is called. The prison. Every time you increase this stat by a dot, you will either gain a madness, which work like derangements, but less weird, a passion, which is a vice, or a corruption, which is a dark urge. So an example could be of a madness could be like a phobia. An example of a passion could be like you, you, you gain a new kink, but it, you obsess over that kink. A corruption would be like suddenly you really, really, really like going and watching dogfights because you're becoming an asshole. What kind of thing you gain depends entirely on what you interacted with when your awareness increased. Uh, at 10, you either ascend and attain ascension or become unplayable as you go completely mad or super dumb. This particular stat does have things you can do with it. Any role related to the truth, which you can ask anytime and I'll tell you yes or no. You can add your awareness rating as bonus dice to said roll. So if Steve wanted to roll to learn about uh, the engineer who has pins in his face, he could add his awareness dice to that roll, because that's the truth of Inferno. However, if Steve wants to learn how to bullet punch better, it's not going to help. I demand uh, the truth about bullet punching. <laughs> when you spend, you can also spend awareness like willpower, temporary points, uh, to add dice to a single spellcasting roll, equal to part or all of your awareness as you see fit. This increases your spellcasting dice pool, which is almost impossible to do, so it's a big deal. We'll get to that later. Uh, to recover spent awareness, you must discover a new secret about a truth you're already aware of. Not learn a new truth, learn something new about a truth you already have discovered. So like, how the engineer got the pins in his face would count for Steve in said example. Uh, awareness also increases your access to investments. Investments are powers from uh, infernal sources, the dreaming, or the world of the dead. Uh, they are paradox free and they usually have one stated specific effect. Some of them are superpowers. Some of them are simply, all right, I'm going to call up this devil, and I'm gonna, the devil's going to be like, I need you to go and punch this guy in the mouth and not ask why, and I'll give you extra really good bullet punching skill, and suddenly Steve gains a dot of martial arts for free as his new infernal buddy starts corrupting his soul. That guy? That guy over there? <laughs> yeah. That one in the suit. Hey! Come here. <laughs> Only the other guy in my head, right? Uh, anytime you attempt to make a deal with a non-human entity for power, uh, it gives you favors that you must do for it, and then you it will give you a number of investment points equal to your current awareness times five. These are freebie points. They buy anything a freebie point does, plus the new powers that I will list to you as if buying like backgrounds. So like Hellfire, five points per dot, for instance. But you can also just spend them as freebie points and boost up attributes and skills. Anything except your spheres, your arite, and your avatar. Those you can never increase by making deals with devils. So the deal the deals get you freebie points in exchange your, for favors. Right, right, right. But when you do that, the the, the amount of freebie points you're getting each time is your awareness times five? Correct. However, the more awareness you spend, the bigger the favor you must do back. Sure. Because the demon's going to look at you at awareness eight and go, oh, here you are an archmage. I'm going to need you to burn Boston for me. Oh, God. 
And then, yeah, you get like 60 freebie points. <laughs> Bro. Nice! Bro. Or whatever. Never liked Boston anyway. Uh, <laughs> you can also use this to attempt to learn investments by studying forbidden tomes. Wouldn't be a mythos game without it. If you find a forbidden tone, you'll roll. Awareness is a dice roll, and the number of successes will determine the number of investments you gain, since each book has specific things it teaches you what you can do. So, like, you read the book, you roll your awareness, you learn this many secrets from the book. Each book has a maximum number of times you can study it. That's a lot like Call of Cthulhu. Questions on that? I mean, probably. No immediate ones, though? No. No, okay. Uh, much like in Call of Cthulhu or Cult, the more you see the truth, the more your perceptions expand beyond the human normal. This is Trapped to Sanity. This is not a new concept, especially in the new world of darkness. Uh, typically, it's tracked as some kind of morality stat, or creatures far from you and have a alternate morality stat. Rachel probably knows all about this with Vampire. Uh, they don't really call it sanity in World of Darkness or New World of Darkness, but it tends to work that way because when you lose morality in those games, you gain arrangements. So it might as well be. Uh, so, Vampire the Masquerade, for instance, uses humanity with a rating of 1 to 10. Most vampires start with 7. The farther it drops, the more monstrous you become. The higher it goes, the, higher, the harder the ideals are to meet, the more pure you are. Uh, it is derived from the combination of two stats, conscience and self-control. There's a third stat in that game called Courage, which is used to create your starting willpower. Those three stats are your virtues. Conscious self control and courage. So we're using that system, but we're resleeving it. So, our system is going to trade uh, humanity for stability. Mark this anywhere on your sheet you would like. Stability starts at 10. Okay. Can you repeat that again? Stability, is this on the sheet or? Nope. Stability. Stability. Yep. Oh, stability. Stability. Okay. It starts at ten. Yep. Oof. We don't have enough bubbles for that. Yeah, I'm just uh, doing two rows. Yeah. yeah. Good. That's a great idea. Okay. I'm gonna let you fill that in real fast while I take care of some real quick. I don't know about you guys. I'm excited. But this is going to be freaking awesome. Yeah. So excited! I am. I'm super excited for this. Stability is made up of three controlling stats like Vampire. These stats, instead of being referred to as virtues, I'm calling cognitions. doesn't really matter what you call them as long as you have the three stats. We may come up with a cooler name if we ever turn this into a story. Cognitions. Yes. The three cognitions, or cognitive functions, were, are clarity, which would be a familiar word for you changelings, rationality, balance. Each of these stats ranked one to five. And character creation, which is right now, you get ten points to spend on all three. Ooh. However, before you spend them, you probably want to know a little bit about them. And also, for those of you that get confused, I will offer you what I think are good starting levels for your particular character concept. Sorry, you said stability? Stability is the ten dot stack. Not stability, then. Shit. Stability is governed uh -huh. by the three cognitions. Can you take it those again? Clarity. Rationality. And balance. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And then when once I 
to tell you what they each mean. You'll have ten points to spend across all three. Got that. Okay. Thank they you. all start at zero. As the game increases, progress. I'm sorry. As the game progresses, you'll be able to increase these with XP, increase mastery of being mages, and dramatic character movements. Much like recovering sanity in Cthulhu. Lose stability, gain some points back to your cognition to bring it back up. Each time you raise your Arate, which we'll get to later, you can roll balance as a dice pool. With the DC, which you don't have to remember this, but when it comes up I'll tell you, but the DC is 3 plus your current awareness level. The more aware you are, the harder it is to maintain balance. If you succeed on the roll, you'll get a free dot to add to any cognitive stat, which means you can bring buy your stability back up after you start losing. You can also buy stability back up with experience. Current rating times two. Stability never goes over 10. Here's where it's gonna get weird, so we might have to go over this a couple times. Stability starts at 10, but it's actually starting higher than your maximum value. The maximum value for your stability is clarity plus rationality. So however many dots you have in clarity, so however many dots you have in rationality equals maximum stability. Meaning, you start high, but as you begin losing points, you can't raise it back up above that total. So if you have like three, maximum sense. right? So if you have three dots in each, your maximum stability is six. After you lose four points of stability, you're at six. You can never again go higher than six unless you raise. Either rationality or clarity. So when that starts coming up, we'll deal with that. Uh, each time you raise your awareness, you automatically lose one stability. Cthulhu Mythos, basically, as a skill. More awareness, less stability. Uh, each time you encounter the truth of the Outer Realms, which, when it comes up in play, it'll matter. You have Outer Realms and Inner Realms. So, like, the Underworld and the Dreamlands are Inner Realms, for instance, Inferno, and the Outer Void of Cthulhu Madness is the Outer Realms. Kind of like if you play D&D, it's like the Outer Planes and the Inner Planes. Kind of like that. Every time you encounter a truth of the Outer Realms, you roll your rationality. If you fail, you'll gain a Passion or a Madness. Every time you encounter a truth of the inner realms, you'll roll clarity, and on a fail, gain a passion or a madness. Stability can be spent like willpower, temporary points. Anytime you want to resist any compulsion from any of your passions or derangements, you're undoubtedly going to gain in this story. If you want to ignore the compulsion or derangement for a scene, spend the temporary point of stability. Boom, ignored. Anytime you want to resist the bad side effects of any magic that isn't sphere-based, remember all those cool devil powers? Yeah, they have side effects. You can spend a point of stability to avoid the negative side effects. Hellfire with no consequences. Good times. And last but not least, you can spend it to avoid any compulsive passion or madness forced on you, as long as it wasn't forced on you with sphere magic. So, like, a human sorcerer casts an uh, inferno spell on you, or a hedge wizard, or a vampire tries to use presence on you, you can spend stability and say, nope, not today, bitch. <laughs> Flat out ignore it. However, if, like, Rachel's character uses mind effects to make Steve giggle uncontrollably, it ain't gonna help. <laughs> Gotta resist sphere magic with sphere magic. Recovering spent stability requires rest and recovery in a place you believe to be safe and calm one point per day or successful use of therapy one point per session those can stack a nice calm therapist office two points so that's a downtime activity basically that doesn't recover permanent points just temporary points you spend so as an example of the system Steve has 10 points he decides to put two in clarity Four in rationality and four in balance. Stability starts at 10. He meets a Razide. 
pins in his face. His awareness goes to two. He loses one point of stability automatically. He rolls rationality, does not gain the deranged. Yeah, man, whatever it's pins in your face, I can handle that. I'm the rocket puncher. His stability is now nine. He later decides he wants that back. So he's going to boost his rationality by spending eight XP, two times current value, to go to five dots. His stability is now back to ten. If you spent enough XP to bring all five, three of those stats to five points, you could have a max stability of ten, for you ask. Uh... Second. Balance, the very last stat, can be used. I will call on you to roll balance a variety of different times. The most important of which is probably uh, every time you, you, you heard me tell you, every time you raise Irritate, you roll stability, or you roll balance as a dice pool to get free points to add to either cognitions or stability. No, it kind of sounds like a first pass. You would just dump balance and put all the rest in the first two. If you do that, you're never going to get those free points. So spend your ten points. Go. I already and did. Ever. Uh, I know we talked about this previously, but <laughs> your particular character, I actually think the most logical in-character concept starting alignment for you is going to be... Uh, Rationality 2, Clarity 3, and Balance 5. Because, you know, backstory elements we'll get into later. Sounds good. <clears throat> You're well balanced, but you believe just about anything. <laughs> well, I wonder why that is. <laughs> uh, so, I went with Clarity 5, Rationality 2, and Balance 3. Makes sense. about you, Harry? I went with uh, with clarity and rationality each at, uh, at four and then with balance at two. Okay. Eric? Still deciding um, or you I got know. it? I don't know which one would be higher for my character. These so I think your character would have a high clarity and balance, but a low rationality because you're a man of faith. You're okay, not a man so of science. Some rationality... For clarity, for balance. Yeah, that's how I'd do it. Okay. Um, Unless you're playing a Jesuit, they're really big into intellectual rigor. I put true. <laughs> five in rationality, three in clarity, and then two in balance. Okay. Does that fit my character? I'm pretty sure it does. But... No. But you could still do it, and I wouldn't stop you. The reason it doesn't fit is you're a dream speaker. You spend half your life in the spirit world. You're not a rational man. <laughs> you, you, you don't you don't worry about mathematics, physics, and geometry at all. Oh, of course. You, wor you worry about spirit wolves. Agreed. Agreed. Clarity and balance, however, you could have pretty high. It still makes sense. Okay. Steven. Uh, I'm going to go with um, balance five. Rationality four, clarity one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense for you. I was gonna say, thinking about, yeah. Okay, so I put balance five, three clarity, and then two rationality. Yeah, that works for you. Thank you. All right. You all got that pretty good. <laughs> uh, at this point, we're gonna touch briefly on those cult spheres. I'm not gonna go too deep into these until it comes up. I will tell you how they all work, like the first dot of each. So they're called lore magics to separate them from sphere magics. The first lore magic is the realm of passions. There's also the realm of madness, the realm of dreams, the realm of death, and the realm of time and space. Unlike sphere magic, anyone can learn lore magic, even just regular people. They're usually very alien to the human existence, though, requiring lots of hours of sustained chants, complex symbols, sometimes massive sacrifices, and other weird shit. Uh, they're stolen from our jailers, which are creatures called lifters. That's how they were learned. Uh, level one of passion is see-through passion. You can detect the true emotions that someone is feeling. You can open up gateways directly to purgatory. 
where the subject will end up based on what their uh, what the truth of their soul is. The subject must be present when the ritual is completed. Completed. Also, they can manipulate passion, controlling another person's emotions. So as you can see, very powerful for a level one effect, but that's the only two things they can do. Control emotions and send people to purgatory. And read your true feelings oh. just by looking at you. They're all dice rolls, but yeah. Okay. Lore magic dream realms. The first dot is see through dreams. You can open portals to view or enter other people's dreams. And then manipulate dreams. Alter the dream in any way you see fit. The first rank of the lore of madness. I have, a, I have an idea, guys. We all do that one and then we hijack Tyler's game and turn it into our own Dream Warriors like retelling. Hell yeah. We start playing D&D. &D. <laughs> I have a plan for that if you try that. Just so you know. Oh, I can't, oh, it's my, there's my book. There's oh, my book. Uh, level one of the madness lore is Unshroud Illusion, allowing you allowing the conjurer to see through any illusions and open portals directly into Metropolis and manipulate senses, set senses, which is create illusions people experience. Makes sense. Totally. The first dot of uh, the realm of death is see through death. You can see into another's death how they're going to die or how they did die. And you can also open portals into the realms of the dead. And manipulate death. You can make zombies and speak to the dead. Those are some really cool powers. Oh, the price is high, but they're pretty awesome, yes. And the number first of, power... The number of... of people smiling at make zombies. I'm concerned. <laughs> the lore of time and space. See through time and space. Create portals to other times and places. However, you must be completely and intimately familiar with the target time and place. And manipulate time and space, meaning perceptions. When you say... Make that day last forever for you. When you also say, when you say intimately, is this like a quantum leap situation where you can only time travel in your own lifetime? Or places you've been seen, but yeah. Hmm. Or like places that an event was distilled so heavily into you. Like, you know, certain traumatic events in American history or things that were beat into your head for 10 years in school or certain presidential election so, cycles. Could we just diablerize a demon? You can't. But oh, it. there are rules for that for the kindred, though. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to eat a demon. Absorb its soul. Okay. Rachel's bucket list: eat a demon. How would you? Yeah. Prefer, how would you prepare a demon? Yeah. Little pepper. Grill. Grilled. Grilled. Flame grill. <laughs> okay. Let's go down so far. All right. Thus is how you merge Kula Mythos and Cult into the world of darkness to create something we're calling the Jail of Night. We did not coin that phrase, though. This was something that was attempted back in the old version of the cult, the old version of the World of Darkness. We're super modernizing it. I forget which magazine it was. It was White Wolf Magazine, something in the 50s. They did it back in like 2002. <laughs> um, so this is your reality, the Jail of Night. Now, we're going to jump into some game rules. A thing we never did last time. Eric, Steven never did major. So, I'm gonna side by side my books here, so hold on. Start with the basics time increments. A lot of this will come up during play, but we're gonna skip through the important ones anyways. People understand how the game works. Uh, the lowest time increment is a turn, which is the same as it is in any RPG. Except in uh, World of Darkness, it's not an exact amount of time. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, like an action turn is like a few seconds, but an investigation turn could be an hour, obviously. Next is the scene, which is the sequence of turns it takes to resolve a dramatic moment 
or the sequence of events between TV show commercials or a single self-contained sequence of events. Next after that is the chapter. We already talked about that. And from that up, then you're talking counting time in the Chronicles. Also, you have downtime, which is not typically counted uh, as a time increment because it's time between events. So there will always be downtime between arcs, between books. And then when that happens, when we come back from to the next book, we'll talk about what you did and any dice rolls necessary for what happened during that time period. Could be lots of time in this game, could be years, depends on what happens. Okay. Uh, World of Darkness, unlike Chronicles of Darkness, uses a floating DC system instead of a set DC of eight where you get penalties to the dice pool. You have very few add or remove dice to a pool, but your uh, target number varies a lot. Typically from five to eight. Anything below that becomes super simple. Anything above that becomes stupidly hard. Also, unlike Chronicles of Darkness, one to four is not a single success. Every single number increases how well you did a thing. One is marginal, three is complete, five is perfection. Or, so if you get a marginal success, it's going to work, but you're going to have a complication. When you get a complete critical success, then you're going to get a bonus. Um, paradoxically, this World of Darkness loves paradox, a high number of dice increases the chance of botching, which of course is rolling any number of ones on no successes. Just as bad as in any other Onyx Bad game. So, uh, also be aware that when it comes to modifying your dice pools, no matter what it is, it can never be, you can never remove or add more than three, either dice to the pool or difficulty to the roll from the base number. There's a cap of plus or minus three. So even if you have five bonuses, you're still only going to get minus three to the DC. Also, a difficulty target number can never go below three or obviously over ten. So, I have things that may help. You can keep these, pin these, we can refer to them later. Completely up to you. You don't have to memorize them. Here's a handy dandy chart showing you how hard a thing is to do on the difficulty slider and how well you succeeded based on number of successes on the dice roll. As you can see, Steve's favorite would be standard. Okay. Um, also, like any Onyx or White Wolf game, Onyx Path Publishing or White Wolf game, when you fail, you fail forward. It's never just going to stop you. I will allow things to continue, but at a higher price. Also, I should point out, this is not Chronicles of Darkness. You don't get beats for converting a failure into a critical failure. Also, critical failures are much worse than Chronicles of Darkness. For that reason, they're not kind. Uh, action types. I'm actually going to wait till Steve gets back for that, because he's going to want to hear that. So we'll jump to spending willpower. Uh, when you spend willpower in a World of Darkness game, you get one free success on the pool, on the roll. So you get a marginal success no matter what. You can never spend more than one willpower in any one roll. Willpower is recovered at the rate of one per very good long night's rest. Just sleeping doesn't count. You have to have a good restful night. You can also recover one point anytime you fulfill your demeanor. And you recover all of them anytime you fulfill your nature. I won't always notice, so ask if you feel like you did. Never hesitate. Um, also, uh, you can't spend willpower on everything. You can on most things. For instance, you can't spend willpower on a willpower roll. You can't spend willpower on a thing you don't know is going to happen. Or a thing that is forced on you. If you can't, you know, if you don't know you're resisting it, you can't use it. That's really it. You can use it on magic. Remember that later. 
But I really want to make sure that thing I don't know is going to happen doesn't happen. Then you're going to need a lot of dots in uh, time magic. Everyone looks at ever. Or entropy. Fate and luck. So, dropping back now, let's these here two action types, because you're going to want to hit this. A confusing subject in a world of darkness. The action types that take place are a move action, obviously. A simple action, which is a straightforward task that requires only a single success. Give someone a dirty look, shoot a gun. A simple action takes one turn. You might need a single success to, like, fix that fuel pump. But it could take two hours, so again, turn time is very Any activity that involves a number of dice rolls before it's completed cannot be a simple action. A reflexive action is something that takes no real time or no deliberate effort. Spending willpower is reflexive. Noticing something that's going on right in front of you without having to search around is reflexive. A brief shout or exchange of words is reflexive. If it takes no measurable game time, it's reflexive. So, on your turn, in combat, for instance, you can take a simple action or a move action and a reflexive action. So if you're ever looking through the book and it says simple or reflexive, now you know what that means. Okay. In World of Darkness, you can take multiple actions in a turn. You do that by splitting your dice pool. So like, if Steve wants to take a shot at, to take a rocket punch at two targets, he's got to roll strength plus martial arts or strength plus dough. He's going to split his strength pool in half, round down, because two targets. Gets the full dough pool. Four, four, four bad guys you want to punch? Divide your strength by four, basically you're nerfing your dice pool. You can never take more actions in a turn than whatever your primary dice rolls. So the, the, attribute. At, so the attribute is what gets split, but the skill yep. or ability or whatever stays... It's not. Correct. Understood. And you can never take... You can never split actions beyond however many dots you have in the attribute required for the roll. Got it. So if I have four, it's four can be split. Yep. yep. All right, okay. Now, the exception to that rule is dodging. You can dodge more than once in a turn, but every time you dodge, you lose the dice from the dex pool and the dodge pool. It's really hard to dodge the more you do it. <laughs> uh, but you can still try. Extended actions are obviously actions that take more than one roll of the dice. If I tell you it takes 20 successes to fix the car and three of you are working on it, you each get X number of rolls until either you run out of time or you succeed. Typically in that case, I'll say each time you try takes 30 minutes, you've got four hours, so you get eight rolls. Pass fail. Go! That's how you handle that. Okay. And like I said, if you fail, you fail forward. If you botch, the hell then real bad things can happen. In the words of Glass Cannon, I'm going to say a couple of things are going to happen. Resisted actions. Resisted actions are when you try not to have the thing happen to you that the other guy's trying to make happen to you. Arguments, seduction, hide and seek, car chases, double rocket punch, all of that. Basically, both players roll dice, most successes wins. Pretty simple. Nothing hard there. Um, there are mitigating circumstances, but typically all that does is change the pool. An extended resisted action gets really weird for me, but not you, so we don't have to talk about it. So, once again, handy dandy chart. There you go. Okay. Teamwork, like most World of Darkness games. Uh, typically involves if more than one people have training in the necessary skill. The assistants roll first. They can grant one success for each. So if Rachel rolls, it doesn't matter if Rachel gets one success or 20, she grants one success to Ever's base roll as the assistant. However, if Rachel fails, she subtracts a success from Ever's base roll. Sorry, Ever. And if Rachel botches, minus two from Ever's base roll. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, trying again 
before anybody ever has to ask about that. You can keep trying, but it increased base difficulty each time. The chart will amuse you. One failed attempt, two failed attempts, three failed attempts. Why bother? And finally, go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, when botches happen in magic, that's a whole other thing we get to. It's real bad. You can tell how bad it is by how excited that kid. Initiative in the world of darkness is Dex plus wits. No base number like in Chronicles, but definitely made it easier in Chronicles. So. Uh, when it comes to initiative time, you all roll dex plus wits as a dice pull and count successes. Highest goes first. On a tie, we compare dex first, then we compare wits. And if it's still a tie, then I'm just going to fix it. Uh, automatic successes, again, only happen if, like, A, you spend a willpower point, and even then you should roll to see if you do better than marginal. Or B, it's such a simple thing, I don't need to roll. Again, the perennial example of drive. You don't need dots to drive to drive a car in the modern world. But you do need dots to drive to succeed in a car chase. Or driving through a blizzard at 60 miles an hour. My dad has a lot of points in that. <laughs> Terrifying amount of points. So, Same. I'm also going to drop you the movement rates chart. We're not really going to touch on it, but someday this will come up. I can pin all these later. Theater of the mind, this doesn't happen often, but eventually I'm going to say they're just faster than you, and this chart will help us reference that. Or you're just faster than them. Uh, dramatic feats. Dramatic feats are all the awesome, fun things you can do. So that when you ask me, I want to lift that car off that guy. I'm going to say, check it. We have a chart for that. I'm going to drop that in here. That's a chart. It's not done yet. It's a multi-page chart. Oh, wow. This will cover almost any action that comes up. So that when you guys are like, I have no idea how this works. We have a chart for that. Gosh. Page three. Steve, knowing what your strength is, Steve, because it's legendary, you will, you will approve. Okay. Yeah. That's right. You can throw motorcycles, buddy. Throw motorcycles. <laughs> so, uh, health and injury. Three kinds of wounds. This always confuses everyone, so we're going to touch on this. Bashing. Bashing is injury you get from getting punched or kicked in, kicked in the, and kicked in the ass, and your teeth knocked out, or getting flung into a brick wall. But it's not the same as the brick wall falling on you or getting shot. It's lethal. Which is also not the same as getting set on fire or burned with the primal energy of the universe. That's aggravated. Oof. Character sheet tracks them all, as you can see. You always go from left to right. And when you hit that final box, if it's bashing or lethal, you're knocked out. If it's aggravated, you're dead. Okay. If you hit that final box, but you keep getting hurt, the earlier boxes roll over. So if you fill up with bashing and get kicked while you're unconscious, that first bashing on the left is now lethal. So now you're dying. Go, Steven. I think what always was confusing me is the you go from left to right is what you said. But when you say that, you mean left is bashing, middle is lethal, right is aggravated. And then you put check marks down as you take each type of damage. On this sheet, that's correct. On this sheet. Okay. On the Chronicles of Darkness sheet, it's reversed. Yeah, it that's goes... what confuses everyone. Yep. Okay. <laughs> but on this sheet, you nailed it. You got it. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. What if I... What if I already have, like, three lethal, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get bashed full, and I go unconscious. And then, the I, last get, point and, then of... I, and then I get kicked again. Does my lethal become four? 
No, the bashing has to upgrade CS. The bashing, all bashing must go legal before lethal can go aggravated. We're, okay. Yeah, I'm just starting at this, the, this, the, yeah. yeah. So if, if I take a, a gunshot and I take a lethal point or whatever, and yep. then someone just ninja kicks me 17 times and I get <laughs> knocked down and filled with bashing, once yep. I'm incapacitated and I take more bashing, I'm just taking more lethal on top of what I've already had, but it's not that first point lethal gets negated. It's just correct. Okay. But what does happen is the second point of bashing becomes lethal instead. The reason that matters is when that last point of bashing becomes lethal, now you're dead. That's the difference between unconscious and kills. So they, they, they roll over if you take more. If you have three lethal and three bashing and you get kicked, now you have four lethal and two bashing. If you get kicked again, now you have five lethal and one bashing. Oh, one last curb stomp, now away. it's all lethal and you're dead. Okay. And it upgrades to the worst type. Yep. Right. But it upgrades from the top, because that's that last box that decides if you're unconscious or dead. Okay. 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 Healing time! Uh, so, uh, bashing damage. So, a lot of what you're going to hear, especially on our show, especially when Devin's in the game, is 15 minutes per bashing point. That is typically how we handle it in the action games. That's not actually correct. And this game is not exactly action, so we're going to use the real rules. Going from bruised... I'm sorry, going from wounded down to bruised, for instance, on the health chart, if it's bashing damage, it only takes you an hour. Going from mauled to wounded takes three hours. Cumulative! So to go from mauled to wounded to bruised, four hours. Which means, I'll show you the chart, and you just have to remember it's cumulative. This is obviously short of supernatural healing. So, in the chart in question, if you were actually an incapacitated, it's going to take you full 24 hours to recover both. Because they all stack. Make sense? Oh god, that's going to be a long time. Someone gets obliterated. They're, yeah. That's that's the main weakness of a mage, is they're still humans, unlike a lot of monsters and wolf darts. Lethal and aggravated, it gets real fun real fast. Oh. These are just more reasons to diabolize a demon and take it straight. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not a, I'm not against my character becoming a super demon. All those powers look really fucking cool. A so if you go down to incapacitated to demons, see, not egg. See you in five months, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. If Steve gets shot and goes down, and you stabilize him, and he loses all his health boxes without magical assistance. It's a five month recovery time. He can still do stuff. But those health boxes stay checked. Yeah, oh. but like any any moderately competent life mage can fix Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. Who are you calling? A, who are you calling a competent life mage? <laughs> Anyone who has three dots in life. Last but not least, penalties. The more boxes you fill, the worse the penalties get. Oh man. Last chance. it. Uh, we don't need to worry about psychic trauma rules from the base game since we're using our own for that. Now, the truth of magical healing in this game is it's not really D and D healing. You can do that. That's harder and risks paradox, which we'll get to when we talk about magic. To help someone heal with a low risk of paradox and a low risk of failure, what you're going to do is instantly heal them. It's going to be speed up the recovery time, so that five month bullet recovery becomes weak. Miraculous. That's much easier. So can a time mage heal me? A time mage can speed up your personal time, and it would work that way, yes, but your body would age. It's not as effective as a healer doing it. Because you still get older at the five-month rate, even though it only takes a day from everyone else's perspective. <laughs> Good question, though. Uh, Tyler, isn't uh, somebody with sufficient life sphere magic, couldn't they do that at the Sanctum without risking much paradox? 
We've changed those rules, which we'll touch on when we get to Paradox. Now, TLDR for you, Eric. Instead of Paradox being vulgar and coincidental, because that's spend half the game figuring out how many units are nearby. Nobody likes that. It's much simpler to do scale. Low level magic, no paradox. High level magic, more paradox. Still simpler at your sanctum because you get more bonuses to the roll. But you're still like gonna get change. you're still gonna get the paradox. However how paradox mm. works is different too. Instead of hey, I'm gonna unleash on you whenever I want. No, your paradox has to build to a specific amount before it bursts. Along the way, weird shit starts happening around you as the universe reveals. So instead of random paradox unleashes to wreck your body, like every three points of paradox, you'll get weirder. Cold cold snaps at first, and then people don't want to be around you anymore, and then animals hate you, and then <laughs> like your aura the gets weird. Against you. I do just want to point out that when John was on the team, we never worried about this because he just killed everyone who could have seen us casting. <laughs> Wait, that's one way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Or he either, okay. either that or he breaks the game. So combat, real easy. Three phases: attack, defense, damage. Probably don't need to go over that. First, somebody rolls to hit. If that's successful, somebody else rolls to avoid being hit. If that's successful, compare the difference, then figure out the damage. Easy. Easy in words, not always easy in that. I don't need to understand how fighting works in this game. Uh, you're, 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 you need to understand maneuvers. Guess what? We're almost there. Oh, shit, yeah. Uh, also, we're using a special rule, similar to uh, Chronicles of Darkness. In, in the book, it's called General Action Rolls. I prefer to call it Mook Fights. In Mook Fights, nobody wants to go through every step of combat as boring. We're going to use these rules. Basically, I decide appropriate dice pool. You roll it against that chart. You win. That's what happens. So, difficulty seven, roll your dice. Dex plus punching. Steve knocks out all six mooks. Done. Instead of rolling for every mook for 12 rounds to fight six mooks. Wow. He gets to feel cool, and we can resolve that fight in less than four sessions. <laughs> so amazing. That is great, actually. Proved. And if you fail a simple roll, you get knocked down with no serious consequence. Questions on that? No, that actually no, that makes got sense. It. Yeah. Group okay. Rolls. Yep. Okay. Combat tactics, combat statuses. Sure. Uh. So basically, there's a bunch of generic maneuvers anyone can do. There are specific martial arts maneuvers only people with dots and martial arts can do. The number of maneuvers available is based on dots. And then there's special maneuvers only the practitioners of Doe or the Way can do who use magic, who use martial arts as magic. That'd only be Steve. Also, there are magical duels called Certamen, where you follow an arcane set of strict rules that Harry's character be able to read to you from memory in the most annoying way possible uh, <laughs> where you duel it out to resolve magical problems when that comes up we'll deal with it I'm not going over those rules right now it's like 30 pages of the book and then These there's magic also duels you're saying like wizard yeah, duels whole, yeah wizard duels whole it's separate set of rules oh my God. when you have to deal with wizard uh, politics the most common forms of punishment are a certain men duel between the two people to resolve the issue or worst case scenario like oh i don't know kill the master gilgal where you go before a council of tradition mages they judge you and then they tear your soul out and you become human good times Man, it must suck to be whoever that person is ah, yeah that that person's a bad day if that ever comes out so Uh, we'll come back to these when we get to abilities, Steve, with these charts you don't care about. Awesome. First chart, order of battle, damage, magical violence in combat, especially spirit combat. You'll care about that, chart. Oh, good. 
uh, health, healing, and conditions in combat, like being ambushed. And here comes the good stuff. I do have a quick question on my spirits. Do I get a separate uh, character sheet for my spirits, or? No, I would control them all. You'd never okay. see the sheets because you don't own them. You just can ask them or tell them to do things. Gotcha, okay. So, the fun things. Armor and shields, and also ranged combat maneuvers. Dirty fighting must have at least three dots and brawls. Those are fun. Complete with nut punch, Steve. Hell Called low blow. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> General hand-to-hand -hand maneuvers. Anybody can try with any number of brawl points. And most importantly for Steven, go special techniques. You can never have more than four, one per die, starting at the second dot of two. Those are the awesome ones, like arrow cutting. You don't just deflect the arrow, you cut that shit down the middle. Hurricane throw. <laughs> yeah, good shit there. 10,000 weapons, that's my favorite. Okay. And okay. for those with martial arts, you can learn two maneuvers per die. Uh, I gotta not cut that off. Hold on. I don't think that's me. No, you must specifically have the martial arts talent. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. Steve has it, so he's gonna want these. There they are. Super dot. Thunder kick! Oh, yeah! <laughs> You've got way too much fun with this. And for the rest of you... <laughs> well, not, not, not all the rest of you, but at least ever in... No, not Eric. Melee weapons! Drink. Complete with crowbar. Very comprehensive chart. Also for you, Steve. Ninja weapons are in there. And the chart carries over for a few pages. It's going to take awesome. And for those of you watching Steve jump around like a ninja guy. I'm going to Indiana Jones this. There's your guns chart. Uh, if it ever comes up, I also have charts for bows, military weapons. No, I'm not going to put all that in there. Specialty ammunition. However, these will be interesting for you as mages. I'm going to throw this in there because this will come up a lot. Environmental hazards. Like fire and electricity. Um... Toxins. Looking at you, Rachel. Why me? Definitely the alchemist if we have one. And then I have comprehensive charts speaking of you, Rachel, also for how to reinforce and enhance items. Tougher. Okay. I'm going to get you that chart, and then that will cover the basics of how the game works. This is your improving modifying and repairing chart. There's These difficulties chart. and modifiers. Yeah, you'll never need all of them at once. But when we do need one, we'll probably be able to say, yeah, we got a chart for that. Okay. Questions on any of that stuff? Probably not, because it's quick. Well, ask anyways. Uh, I do have to ask. Um, do we need to buy these, or... Will they eventually be given in the game, or what? Depends on what it is. No. Common things, I would just say you have exotic things that you'd have to go find. Okay. Well, for, like, ranged weapons. That will depend heavily on the character, whether you start with any. Oh. Whether, how, how easy it would be for you to pass the background check in the human world. Oh, alright. Yeah. Or your contacts, should you have them, that can get them to you illicitly, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, okay. Look at that. Right on time to take a quick break before we move on to characters, where we actually get to start talking about your characters. And then magic. And then we'll actually play. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Yo. So, audience, we'll be back in about seven minutes. We'll make this one quick at about 10.35 Eastern time. 36, 10.36. Okay. Sure. All right. In a couple minutes.
And we're back. The first half of the show, we talked all about Mage Rules and how we're merging the settings of the Cthulhu Mythos, Cult Divinity Lost with Mage the Ascension, and some fun new awesome rules. This part, we're going to talk about their characters. Way more exciting. And we're going to talk about how magic works in the movie flow. So, characters first. We're going to go round robin. We're going to talk about archetypes, which is your concept. And then we're going to talk about your natures and demeanors. At this table, you are all mature, responsible gamers, which means everything here is player knowledge only, not character purchased off from your character's minds. Because secrets are boring when the audience doesn't know what they are. Some things, if you want to remain a secret from everyone, don't say. But if you just want it to be a secret from the party and the NPCs, please say. Starting in the normal order, tell us about your simple concept in a couple sentences or less, and then your art, your nature and demeanor. So that means we start with... Steve. Yes. Um. <clears throat> so. Am I muted? There was a lot of changes happening. No, I'm not. No, muted. you're good. Perfect. So. Um. Yes. Again, my name is um, Drake Jones. Um. Drake Jones is a part of the Akashiyana Order. Um. A very interesting backstory. Uh, tr uh, from the uh, west coast of the United States, uh, trained under a <laughs> traditional, um, fronted as like a strip mall um, martial arts Sifu, Sifu Sean. Um, at that time, not knowing any better, being a newer recruit to the order, um, did I know that usually Sifus for the Akashan order only have one student, but this one had several. And he was actually training us for a war, um, eventually, because he thought war was coming with the Wulun. Um, my training was brutal, physically demanding. We were often just beaten and broken, and it was called training. Um, it was our responsibility to learn to get better. If you don't want to get beat up every day, you, ha you take it upon yourself to get better. Um, eventually, after several years of meditation on the subject, I started to pull powers unknown uh, to the Sifu from chaotic forces all around us. During a sparring session, my frustration and new powers boiled over, and during the opening ceremony for the sparring session, I attacked and killed my master before the fight even begun. Uh, the other students, shocked at this worked, agreed to cover up the killing, um, and our story was that there was an attack um, from unknown forces, and he was killed. Uh, since then, I carry the secret, and the more I learned about the order outside of his control, the more I learned how wrong he, is, he was and how his teachings went against pretty much everything the order stood for. Uh, I seek to learn more about secret societies as compensation for the secret I carry and will not talk about or tell anyone. Um, and I am now part of a Vajrapani sect and work with the other players um, doing work for our Chantry. Um, but essentially, yeah, brutal training, killed my master, carry that secret. Um, and the core of my teachings and my fighting style is very counter to a lot of what you would know from other Akashiana. It's very. Brutal. Johnny Cage. <laughs> it's very brutal. Um, attack first. Um, not quite as honorable or, you know, those those types of stereotypes. So, yeah. What is your nature and demeanor? Also, for any of you who don't have these on your astral sheets, you can add them when your turn pops up. I did have them when I turned them in. It's not on my astral sheet. Um... Hold on, let me see if I can find it very quickly. Yeah, I am also going to have this problem because I totally forgot what I picked. I did too. Oh no. Actually, I know they're in the prep room, but I couldn't find them if they're not on your sheet. Or, I scrolled for a minute and was like, eh. Oh no. Let's see. Oh, I'm so sorry. How do you Nature spell? shows me. Find this.
Okay. I'm so sorry, uh, everybody. Um, so I remember going through it. Does anyone? Do we want to come back to mine, maybe? Yeah, we can come back to yours. Okay. Which means we go to Ever next. <laughs> okay. Cool. So I'm going to be playing Gabriel Hargrave, who um is part of the cult of ecstasy and for those of you who don't know what that is it's drugs and alcohol or how you find your magic <laughs> um the concept for this character is guardian spirit and the nature is guardian the demeanor is cavalier my specialties are primarily physical secondarily mental um Got a lot in talents and knowledges. Skills are second or third place for that. My primary spheres are time, forces, and then spirit. Um, in that order. Uh, let's see here. What else shall I share with you? You got to tell them your backstory. Oh, do you, that's you want what they me to want read to know. That? <laughs> yeah, none of okay. that needs. I don't think anything on yours needs to be super secret. So. I want to tell you guys first about, um, oh. like, the mundane stuff. Yes, you should start with the mundane stuff, but I'm also going to say, Eric, surprise, pay attention to this backstory. <laughs> Carry on! Uh, so living family for Gabriel are Pop, who is his stepdad, and he's a factory laborer. Uh, props to Sean, because, you know... Sport labor. Sport labor. <laughs> Sean has a couple, like... What are they? Not cameos. Um, name drops tonight. <laughs> um, Dad, who is his biological father and is a religious studies professor. His sister, who is his biological sister, she's a college student. And his dad's parents, who are in a uh, nursing home. Deceased family are his mother, who was a minister, and his pop's parents, which are his stepdad's parents, uh, who were also laborers. His disowned family are his mom's parents, who are both ministers. Family history is Gabriel's dad was married to and loved Gabriel's mom. They met in college. His mom died of cancer, and after a couple of years, Gabriel's dad came out as bisexual to the family. The children took it well, and dad's parents had always sort of guessed, so they didn't have a hard time with the news. Um, his mom's parents disowned dad, Gabriel, and his sister because they were children of sin, and they accused dad of his sin being the reason behind his mother's death. About six months after the disowning, Dad found Pop at a support group for LGBTQIA folks, and it was love at first sight, just like when Dad met Mom. His sister is asexual and polyamorous, and she has two partners that she loves with all of her heart and cuddles ferociously. One partner is a deaf, non-binary college student, and the other partner is a trans woman college student. Gabriel currently has no significant other since he graduated high school due to his devotion to the vision he experienced during his DMT vision, feeling that his mission in life is to forget about himself and protect his charges that he has been given so far, otherwise he's pansexual. Gabriel's education are a high school degree and a multi-phase seminary degree, an MA major in religious studies, a minor in history. Gabriel's work history. He has only ever worked in positions of being a bouncer, security guard, or underground fighter. He has the capability to be clergy due to his degree, but will never agree to it. Same with teaching. Uh, so, Cult of Ecstasy, his, his reason of how he got in it. A mage sensed the abilities Gabriel had been given after his vision. This mage had known Gabriel prior to Gabriel's awakening and introduced him to the Cult of Ecstasy after he found out what had happened to the boy. So, a journal entry from Gabriel Hargrave. I really just wanted to feel something, to know something exists beyond this ridiculous joke we call life. To do that, of course the first thought on an 18 year old's mind is either a near death experience, which I was reckless, but not that reckless, or drugs. Yeah, I went with drugs. There was this guy I knew that could get his hands on anything, and I do mean anything. Being that I was at rock bottom and I just needed something to tell me that this life was worth sticking around for, I really, really didn't know what I was in for. Telling this dealer what I wanted got me a laugh. Yeah, yeah, kid, I've got just the thing. 
I think he figured I just wanted a typical young adult type high to feel good, but what I really wanted was to touch the divine in a totally tripped out psychedelic kind of revelation only achievable with some heavy duty hallucinogens. Obviously that sentence wasn't compiled at that age. Only now do I realize what I was getting into. If I knew then what I know now, well, it'd be a much different situation, to say the least. DMT. The guy gave me. A kid. DMT. Maybe he thought it would be funny, but I'll never know. Strangely, after that one meeting, it was like he never existed. He disappeared off the face of the earth, and it was like no one had ever heard of him before that, either. As a dumb kid, I decided the best way would be to smoke the stuff. I know better now, making a tea from actual herbs is much easier on the body and the lungs. I don't remember anything after that hit, and that's all it takes anyhow, to jetstream you into the land of machine elves and cosmic oneness. It was a bit out of the ordinary that I saw none of those things. But what I did see ripped my soul asunder and stitched it back together again without anesthetic, using a thorn as the needle and barbed wire as the thread. Normally getting high off DMT is intense, just not that intense. There's parts of this story that are meant to stay between me and the divine beings that imparted a bit of the arcane to me that day. But what I can tell you is that I saw every deity. Goddess, god X, god, and each one took a part of me, however small it was, and reshaped it before performing the restitching of the very fiber of my being. Now I'm beholden to every single one. It was all of them that grafted the wings onto my back, strip by strip. Before I took that hit that changed my life forever, I had asked for something revolutionary. If only I'd had known. <laughs> the end. Now you need to tell them, number one, the bit that affects Eric, the most important bit, and two, that you're not human. Yeah, so, um, Oh gosh, where to begin? Uh, so Eric, by the way, you are my charge. I have to protect you at all costs. Don't fuck up. <laughs> I'm so not sorry. What they're not mentioning is when they had their moment of universal oneness with all of the deities, they were told you were the chosen one. Only you can bring balance back to the world. Could have been the DMT. Oh, no. Could have been the gods. Believes it no matter which it was. Drugs, gods, no one knows. You're uh, the Anakin the... Skywalker of uh, Mage of the Ascension? No, no, you're the chosen one, Eric. You're the Anakin. Actually, you're the... <laughs> oh, nah. you're now I, now the... I know you're tripping. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, this particular person never leaves you alone and always like, I must defend you from the evils of the world. And eventually, the Vatican took an interest and was like, we're going to interview this person. And took them to Vatican City for a week and you're like good I'm over that however a week later they came back with a note saying this person is going to be your guardian give them a bed at the church and that's how it's been ever since <laughs> your oh ordained body card <laughs> um, yeah and and also so the wings were a reference to um, Dark Angel. my my character is named Gabriel but is not Gabriel uh possibly has or some or are you or I don't even know uh or am I part demon that's my dark secret is I don't actually know if I'm part angel or part demon I just assume angel because wings and uh my mother was a minister hmm. but uh, that's, a, that's, that's a big butt. But these wings are uh, not. You can't tell what they are. Angel. They're not feathery white angel wings. They are shadowy wings that like emit light, so no one can actually tell what they're made of or if they're good wings, evil wings. I mean, not that. I'm trying to get are... the picture for them. Oh yeah, there's there's a full picture. Where's Dean? Give me Dean. There it is. I got it. Uh, oh, that's a gift. Okay, that works too. 
when Ever's character unfurls, as it were, in their wings. This is what happens. Complete with the glowy face. In other words, they're not physical, but they still work, and they make noise when flat. Side note, if I use my spirit sphere, they will be visible to anybody, so I can really fuck things up for the group if I use my spirit sphere. Go. Yeah. So, falling back to Steve. Did you find a cool demeanor? If not, let's do it. Uh, I, I found... Did not find demeanor. That's what you're asking specifically, no. Yeah, go ahead and tell us about your nature. And then but I, but I did find my nature. So my nature is uh, actually it's activist. Um, having unknowingly entered the order through this um, kind of rogue master secret group, um, I, I, I personally now I am kind of chasing other secret societies and conspiracies and trying to expose them. And I want to get as much of the truth out as possible, either through broadly broadcasting secret societies I'm not in with, or teaching my own sort of like personal philosophy, and and getting the truth of it out there. So activist, get the truth out. But I do not have a. De- so the first demeanor that comes to mind immediately for you is bravo. You have little tolerance for weakness, especially in yourself. Regain willpower when you intimidate or physically force someone to do what you want or back down. Yeah, no, that sounds about right. All right, let's do that. <laughs> what was that called? Bravo. Bravo. Yes. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about that because he comes from this, you know, uh, really strict, physically demanding, brutal training regiment. That's kind of his. That's where all of his stuff comes from. He's trying to work through it because he knows it's not the best way to live, but it's also gotten him where he's gotten in the powers that he's able to pull. He's essentially learned to pull powers using the martial arts things that he was doing from chaos itself. So his entire mindset is about ripping order from chaos. Um, so essentially, you know, he, he says things like, what is order except control of chaos? When the snake hunts, he's in control, but the rabbit he bites, he's only randomness and chaos in those final moments. Be the hunter, be the snake, impose order, uh, impose chaos on others and snatch order for yourself. That's essentially his philosophy. Yep. Eric. Man, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that. Um, <laughs> I be the snake, e- not punch. E- ever, ever yeah. stole this one. That was incredible. Um, the original idea I had was just that you know Jose Vega is a Catholic priest from South America. He was inducted into the chorus when he came across some miracle maker who was forming a cult around them. Uh, Vega was sent in to investigate, covered real magical forces and the nefarious source of this cult. Um, when he was in danger, these gifts began to emerge, and he managed to escape. Um, after he recovered from what happened, uh, the cult and the leadership had been demolished by some shadowy forces, so um, he, they just disappeared, and he didn't know what happened to them until well, a little bit later. They, those same shadowy forces showed up at his doorstep. Uh, they noticed something about him that he didn't he had always that was there but he couldn't really acknowledge until that moment and um he was after that he bas- they basically picked him up and that's when he started getting involved with the chorus and he started delving into the uh secrets of the universe as it were um his experiences there challenged his beliefs a lot more than anything else he had experienced in his life so uh, it seems like the deeper he goes into the truth of what actually what reality actually is the farther away he gets from god um so he's the whole concept is just you know he's this priest who on the one hand is like well this is a tremendous opportunity a tremendous power that can be used for the benefit of mankind but on the other hand it's like this goes completely against everything that i've ever been taught and it's threatening to shatter my belief which is the most important thing to him um his 
spheres, as it were, the strongest of the three is primal, because, you know, the structure of the universe and all that. <laughs> Forces, because, which I thought was an odd choice at first, and then the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. Uh, it's the second strongest of his spheres, and he, uh, I imagine Vegas is the type that he's, you know, traveled around and, uh, around enough that he has, you know, water from uh, the River Jordan, or like, uh, wood pertaining to an old crucifix uh, belonging to a dead martyr or something like that. Something, something that he keeps with him that he could use to sort of channel his powers through. Um, and the last one, of course, is, is the weakest of the three that he has focus in, which is spirit. So while, you know, because he is losing his faith, essentially, so that's the weakest of the three that he has. Um, as far as the abilities are concerned, he's pretty average, nothing special to look at. He's a little charismatic because he's a priest, so of course he is. He has a focus in theology, uh, belief systems, uh, and I gave him something interesting with his background. So I put about four points into wonder, so he has like an actual like a magical gift or artifact that can uh, aid him at times. Um, now, mm -hmm. before you worry about the rest, there is one more very important thing, then we'll do the other dots and stuff later on the rest of the character sheet. But, super player knowledge, not character knowledge, mm. purge your brains. So, sometimes you're just born bad. <laughs> when a Nefandi dies, their soul is torn apart by the call, or they ascend to descend to godhood. The soul moves on and recycles. Sometimes, that soul gets shoved into a human instead of being sent out into the netherworld of hell and becoming part of Inferno. Sometimes even the Nefandi make it happen on purpose by finding a reincarnated soul like finding like finding a Sith Lord and shoving them into a poor kid's body. Birth, from the moment of consciousness, that poor kid can see and hear that that avatar, that that, that soul, always telling him, kill that cat, push that kid off the cliff be bad, be the villain. That's how Eric was born. We call those Witter Silantia. Born evil, doomed to fall unless he fights with every bit of his soul. However, should he not fight, he has the best chance of dissension because his soul is the strongest. Of all of you. Maybe he really is the chosen one. The question is, will he save the world or end it? So is this like Macaulay Culkin from The Good Son stuff going on? Worse than that. But yes, that would have been his childhood had he not been able to fend off those dark impulses. Huh. Which I'm sure he totally fended off every time. Ever fell to those temptations? For 30 years? Every day? Next! Oh, I should point out too, for those people who might see this video that are understand how the Nefandi work, in the older versions of the World of Darkness, where does Leonte were just done, like they were cursed. If the character had that, they were NPCs. However, it can just be a flaw in Mage Essential 20th Anniversary, because anyone can overcome, it's the theme of the game, rise above. Next would be Rachel. Hello! Yeah, I do not have anywhere near as uh, intricate a background uh, as uh, ever uh, or Steve. Uh, but I have been sort of noodling around with uh, where this character might have come from. Um, she's pissed off at God. Like, a lot. Like, so much. Um, I've been sort of envisioning her having a very um, middle-class suburban upbringing uh, and just from an early age being like wait all this is bullshit it's all bullshit just has to go to Sunday school hates it doesn't want to go has to go anyway it all sucks um, probably got into Wicca like every 15 year old girl who wants to rebel against religious parents does <laughs> uh, which set the stage for her eventual awakening um, and so uh, 
I didn't really come up with how it happened, but I think it might be cool if, like, in the moment of her awakening, she sort of realizes everything. Like, the whole truth, the cosmic truth. Oh. Um, but then forgets most of it. So. And now she's trying to find it again. That is perfectly fine. We actually didn't come up with what happened. I'm again, sorry? I said that's perfectly fine, but we did actually come up with what happened. Again, player knowledge only. Stolen fire. In order for that to be true, Rachel's character would have had to have stolen something important and supremely powerful that gods wouldn't want man to have. And if the gods are the ones chasing you down, sometimes you get caught. When you're desperate, you do what you have to do to get rid of said thing. Like, I don't know, eat it. And okay. become one with it and awaken because it's part of you now. Prometheus didn't just give the fire to the humans, this Prometheus ate the fire and became the fire. So yes, carry on. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm writing down the notes. Oh, yeah. So like, what would be like a cool thing for her to have eaten? I'm crowdsourcing. Apple of Eden. No, so, um... Part of a demon? So... <laughs> And we'll get to this too in a minute, but quintessence is the supernatural energy of the universe condensed into bite-sized form that you can absorb into your body and use to power magic. Quintessence can take physical form in an area where the magic is powerful or a master of prime can force it. It becomes tasked at that point, you can hold it and literally eat it. And it can take the form of literally anything. So how weird do you want to get? <laughs> oh goodness, let's get weird. Uh... He's the demiurge. Like it, it, could, it could be you were told it was a piece of the demiurge, even though that might or might not be true, and it manifested in the form of a marshmallow. Well, so uh, we, we've sort of established um, my character is weird around uh, religion. Uh, she could have stolen a religious artifact of some kind, uh, intending to use it in some like. Uh, knock off Wiccan ritual. Ooh. Uh, I Ooh. didn't realize, like, oh shit, this is way more power than um, my uh, drugstore altar can handle. Let's make it dark then. Make it dark and weird. Uh, 2021 year old uh, unleavened bread from, I don't know, maybe a Last Supper. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's, I'm pretty sure that's moldy by now. Might want to check the expiration date. <laughs> Too late, she ate it. <laughs> she took that communion. Okay, I, I, I enjoy it. I appreciate it. Uh, so, she also now feels like, oh, wait, we're, we're all in a prison even though she doesn't really know any of the details, uh, but she now focuses herself on uh, overcoming uh, flesh prison, overcoming her mind prison. Uh, so she uses psionics a lot. Uh, she's got mind, life, and spirit as part of this practice. Um, she's a hollow one, so she's sort of opting out of uh, the traditions in general along with the technocracy because she's like they're all hierarchical bullshit don't want uh, her nature is innovator uh, we didn't pick a demeanor but uh, since she's got chip on her shoulder I'm thinking like rebel yeah that's what I would have recommended yep <laughs> Either Rebel or I might have set off on guard, but Rebel fits better. Okay. Yeah. That means we bounce to Harry next. Yes, I am playing uh, David Browning. That is his full name, there, although there are a few names in between the David and the Browning, but he generally doesn't introduce himself that way. His nature <laughs> is perfectionist, his demeanor is judge. Uh, he was a trust fund baby that, that ended up becoming an art dealer. I uh, prided himself on his knowledge of the arts and of and his ability to just pull that information 
out of his head whenever needed, really. Um, one day, however, he was called on a lead to a bizarre little basement apartment in Brooklyn, and he encountered a piece of art that was indescribable, not beautiful, but there was some sort of terrible quality about it. And as, when he left that apartment, he everything was changed. And so obviously he pursued this further and further until eventually his own individual pursuits brought him in contact with the Order of Hermes. And that's where he is today. That's for Steve. Did it perchance look like this, that piece of art? <clears throat> Anyways, uh... Hmm, where have I seen that before? <laughs> hmm. Oh. <laughs> so, Harry also has an awesome dark secret that his player only knows. Harry, his character, is a gorgeous, whipsaw smart, hyper focused, elegant, fashionable twin sister who's also dead, but still hangs around Harry's apartment. For a member of the Order of Tremere, Harry's character has committed one of the ultimate sins. His twin sister was vampirized and is a member of the undead. He has not put her down and has allowed her to be in on the secrets of his existence. From his tradition, that's real bad, y'all. Yeah, that is a kind of a kind of a whoopsie. Well, what what clan? Tremere. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> Oh, they're gonna be so, so bad! <laughs> they're gonna be so bad! Well, I'm just, like, uh, I, I would ask, like, why does it? Why isn't she living at the Chantry? But I'm pretty sure that she'd be like, no, stay, <laughs> stay there. Uh, where did I put it? My next bonuses. No, we're not done with Harry yet. Oh yeah, okay. It still gets worse. I gotta find where I sent you your blood. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, it gets, it still gets worse. A member of the Tremere, who's also Masasa, which are the sect of the Tremere actively at war with the Order of Hermes. They're like eco-terrorists against the assholes that are the Order of Hermes. Wow, so you're at war. <laughs> Why won't he disown his twin sister? Sure, it's his twin, but maybe there's another reason, too. Maybe they share twin avatar, two pieces of the same soul. And if they don't physically touch at least once a month, bad shit happens. You know it's not? I have a twin sister in real life. <laughs> I think you told me that when I sent you that. You're like, that's too perfect. Uh, Did I? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, and last but not least, if they don't make contact, not only does he take negatives, so she does have to come hang out, and you all probably do know she exists. Maybe not the secret. He shares some of her problems, too, because their souls are linked. Sometimes Harry needs a drink. You just get urgent, you see. <laughs> so! Matara's gonna be so mad at you. Thus is Harry's character. Anything else you want to add? Um, he is stupidly wealthy and kind of dumb with money. Makes a lot of bad choices. But very posh. So there's that. All right, Jared. All right. Um, so my character is part of a tribe. Um, he is actually part Werekin. And the big dark secret around him is that when they were doing the actual uh, ritual to for someone to become Werekin, the very last of his family... I gotta went, stop you for a second. What? You're doing good. But some of this is new to Jared, by the way, so I might be helping him a little here. Okay. But he's a Werekin, which for anyone who doesn't know means he's part of a family that... Sometimes the offspring of the family become shifters, become were creatures. In his case, wolves. 
So his bloodline can give werewolf offspring, gives him a variety of contacts and advantages, but also disadvantages and makes him very feral. However, the last time an actual werewolf was born into the clan is what he means. You tell them what happened. Okay. Um, when an actual werewolf got put into the clan, it basically became, I wouldn't say demonic, but like basically spiraled out of control and actually killed his mom and dad and basically his whole family. And that was kind of like his awakening, kind of defending them. And then after that, they uh after that i think that's when kind of like when the dream speakers came in and uh yeah that's what i got from that uh, funny you should say oh. spiraled out of control because that werewolf yeah. is now a black spiral oh, I, still I was alive. asking how deliberate use of that word was yeah i called it i called <laughs> it i put it in discord i called it it was a black basically a black spiral and i have a immensely hatred for anything that is a black spiral werewolf if i if, like i said he has a hatred and he will go at no lengths to kill any of them and i will be role playing the shit out of that so i might kill the party if that i mean <laughs> black spiral dancers are bad yeah. but bad yeah uh, black spiral dancers are to werewolves what nefandi are to mages shoot on sight so don't worry the party will probably help you shoot it yeah i'll help you take him down irredeemable evil yes i can do like a spin kick and uh nature and demeter i was gonna go with one of them being anarchist if i could that would be your demeanor your nature what did you pick it's on your sheet what is it? here's we had I do. uh you're leo right yeah I was I gonna go with yourself. Yeah, anarchist demeanor. Or demeanor. I don't think we uh, picked. You it picked out, the nature. Everybody did. Okay. Hold on, I'll get it. I got this. I found theirs. I can find yours. Okay. Uh, start with a W. Um, no, survivor, because you're an orphan. You pick oh, survivor yeah. for your nature because we're. That's the part he didn't mention is after his parents died, he grew up a ward of the state because his tribe is gone, yep. and he's just a street mm. rat bouncing from. Uh, 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 wow. Uh, what's it called when you don't get adopted but you live with people? Born Born state. Foster. Foster. Foster parents to uh, orphanages for all of his formative years. Yes. All right, those are cool backstories. Next, uh, does anyone have any? Well, no. Before we get to that, you all still need to pick essences, which is at the top of your sheet, and you'll see that we didn't do that ahead of time because oh, I forgot. So there are four essences for a mage. This, an essence, is uh, the reflection of your personality, the way your avatar will manifest itself. For those of you with magnifier avatars that can talk and interact uh it's also a general script for lack of a better word for your behavior goals your habits the way you approach life it's all typically guided by your essence also when you start accruing paradox it will determine what weird shit happens around you there are four essences dynamic which is change manifesting as Passionate emotions, restless drive, maybe a mercurial temperament, fickle spirits. Dynamic avatars compel their mages towards daring experiences. You're never boring. Second is pattern, which is the very opposite of dynamism. The pattern essence provides stability and order. Dynamism is fire, then pattern is stone. Pattern mages approach things with deliberate intent, speaking slowly. They consider ramifications, benefits of a task. They have calm temperaments that are logical and stable, and often authority figures. Third is primordial. Before there was light and order, there was chaos. Themes. Uh, even now, that eternal enigma of primordial chaos beckons to the human soul, manifesting as shadows, half heard cries, swirling vortices, pulsating energy. You're going to have a weird avatar. It's awesome. 
Mages connected to that end tend to be abrupt and secretive, or else seductive in the way that only the fallen can appreciate. You would love mysteries. You're like deep water seeping into hidden places and defying easy understanding. If a pattern is a brick wall, you're the riptide. And last but not least, we have questing. Wherever windmills beckon, you'll find Don Questing Quixote the Mage, preparing to tilt. Vagabonds and errants, pilgrims and pioneers, you prefer the open road and a worthy cause. You avoid extremes, you tend to manifest yearnings, wanderlust. The bright spot on the horizon, you like to travel. Maybe even hitchhike in these dangerous hitchhiking days. Your theme song might be Call Me the Breeze. Please pick your essence. Are we going in normal order? What was the yeah, we'll go in the normal order because it'll be easier. Sorry. And what was the first one again? Dynamic. So that'd be you, Steve. I think I'm going to go with Primordial. Yeah, that fits you really well. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ever? I'm assuming questing because my character with the whole protective bits. Got to try everything once, too. Eric! I think you're muted. Sorry, I'm a dum dum. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking either pattern or primordial. Uh, pattern because authority figure, order, etc. Primordial because of that Wittersley yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Joy 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 is it like a? Is it something that changes essence, or is it like in stone? Very rarely, it would be a major character arc for that to change. Okay, so if it, if it goes to, it could potentially go from one to the other, then from pattern to primordial, uh, stone to water. Yeah, especially so. If you think you might like, whichever you think will compel you more. If you start primordial and become pattern, you're winning the battle against your darker nature. If you start pattern and go primordial, maybe you're losing. Or maybe you're learning to embrace it to control it. That could go either way. I think I'll start with pattern. Okay. Oh. I like it. Rachel. Uh, dynamic and primordial both seem like they fit, just in different ways. Yeah. I think probably dynamic for you more than weird and creepy and chaotic. More like you must solve every mystery. Not because you yeah. care about the mystery, but because you're bored easy. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And like dynamic fits with her like change, personal growth, constant personal growth. Yes. Okay. Harry. Okay. Um, I'm trying to decide between pattern and dynamic. Uh, Dynam dynamic. dynamic is the essence of the artist. Yep. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do dynamic. And Jared, I'm um, going by uh, going by the backstory and the way my character is. It's definitely gonna be dynamic. Yep. So. Correct. All right. Next, you're all good the way the way your attributes are. Yes, you don't have to go over yep. every die, but let's make sure you're all good. Yep. I will point out, Steve has legendary strength six dots because of some of his superpowers. True. <laughs> He is the Iron Steel Fist. The, He's the Steel the, Fist. The, the, the Adamantine the, Fist. Yeah. He is the Eye of the Tiger. He's the Jet Li <laughs> of this world. He is the thrill of the fight. <laughs> However, he likes to wear shoes. <laughs> Saying for no reason. I do, and I'm not overly obsessed with my name. This is good. All right, so... Abilities. Does anyone have any questions about what any of the abilities mean? Especially the weird ones. Um, actually, I did have a couple questions on that one. What you got? It was the um, Enigma Estor Esoterica. I believe that's... Va Esoterica is basically vampire or werewolf knowledge, am I correct? Nope, those are lores. Lores? Okay. Knowing a specific thing about a specific supernatural entity would be a lore. Okay, cool. Um, 
and each lore dot would be for a specific creature. Esoterica is like astrology, angelography, fortune telling, yoga, demonology, storm lores, rune lores, secret code languages of occult societies. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then cosmology is dimensions, subdimensions, other worlds, deep space. That's why yours is higher in that one. Okay. Enigmas is puzzles, figuring out puzzles and riddles. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, okay, that's all. Uh, those are the only ones. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, traditions. Some of you talked about yours a little bit. But in case it was missed, for those who don't recognize the symbols on these awesome backdrops, uh, Ever is the cult of ecstasy, which in this world is much more like a cult. Uh, Eric is the celestial chorus, who are aware that the demiurge is gone. Some of them hunt for him, hear it, find it, find out what went wrong. Some have even gone into the abyss, where its city once stood in Metropolis, and none have ever returned. And some are just like, God might be dead. That doesn't mean we're gonna shut down religion. That'd be silly. This is, this is a billion dollar industry. Uh, and some have just turned to other entities and deities. Uh, Steve's character is part of the Akashayana, formerly known as the Brotherhood, the Akashic Brotherhood. It's an outdated term, though, so it's the Akashayana now. They uh, turn inward to find out the mysteries of life and existence. Mastery of the self equals mastery of the universe. Uh, also, thank you for the raid, carry and comfort. Hi, y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to us learning about mage. Uh, Harry's character is the Order of Hermes. The oldest, most organized, according to most sources, most powerful magical tradition, also typically most in charge. Like the Ventru, but not vampires. Also like the Ventru, Ventru very often. <laughs> very much really into high ritual like... magic and the masters of war. You want a fireball done right? Yeah, call order of Hermes. Oh, yeah. Um, last but not least, Rachel's character is a hollow one, which in this reality... Hollow Ones are actually have a seat on the tradition, the Council of Nine Traditions, so it's the Council of Ten Traditions. Oh, we shouldn't, that was such a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Steve, martial arts, I was going to touch on this here. You, you're good with, you need you one dough uh, maneuver for every dot starting at two. Um, uh, how many dough dots do you have? I have four dots in dough. So you need three dough maneuvers. Okay. You know. Um, and then how many dots of martial arts? Three. Six martial arts maneuvers. Okay. And just pick the so ones you want from the charts we fit. Six martial arts maneuvers, three and dough. Three dough. Maneuvers. Got it. Yep. All right. I have a follow-up question. Yep. Um, actually, what's an example of a situation in which I could use the conspiracy theory skill you gave me like is that just for seeing through like really weird connected things yes okay anytime you might need to make a roll to figure out the connection i'm gonna let you roll that it's super generic <laughs> yeah yeah okay so so no is... I'll, I'll take that back anytime you need to roll to find a hidden connection you'll roll that a hidden connection okay yeah. all right however if you fail that roll if you're gonna give them the most awesome, oh, Mulder went down the wrong tree I, this, information. Like you were gonna spend 35 minutes RPing my Mulder slash Charlie Day Pepe Silva seat going on, so I'm ready yes. for that to fail miserably. Okay, thank you. I support it. <laughs> support. Does anybody have any questions about your backgrounds? The ones I gave you, the shared ones, or the ones you picked. I'm assuming okay. you're good with the ones Actually, you picked. I'm sorry, I have one question about the backgrounds. We're yep. going to get separate, um, are we going to get any character sheets in terms of our familiars? Nope. Oh, I control those two. Familiars don't have character sheets, they just have a specific set of things they can do. They can give you advice at a high enough rank, they can protect you from harm, and they can absorb paradox, which they don't like doing, but they can and will. Okay. 
unlike older versions of Mage, they don't have a whole separate machine anywhere. I know that one game you were in, they did, that was an older version. Yeah, that was, yeah. Was yeah, you don't need all that anymore. Really weird. Yeah. Overly complex. Very. Anybody else? Um, you, however, can name it. Okay, go ahead. No, I think I'm good. Okay. Do we want to talk I do need, about to, know, I do need to know. I do need to know by next week, though, what the name of Rachel's emotional support coyote is. What'd you say, Steve? Oh, that's right. I do have an emotional support coyote. <laughs> you do. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm getting really weird looks from my fiance. Call it Walter. <laughs> Can I be Hold your on. emotional support coyote? I was going to make you role play, yes. Yes. <laughs> 57, hey. anyone? Uh, oh, no. hang on. I'm looking up trickster guts right now. What were you going to ask Steve? Loki, I, um, I, I did. I was asking what well, well, did we want to share, like our backgrounds and, and kind of what we fill in for that. Like we don't have to go over every attribute and skill, but background. Oh yeah. Usually. Once I make sure there's no questions, we are going to go over backgrounds, merits, and flaws real fast. We're not going to describe them all, but we're going to list them off for people to hear. Okay, sounds good. So, do that next. We'll start with Steve. Oh my. Give us your backgrounds and their level. Not the group ones, just your personal ones. Personal ones. So, heads up, I went heavy on backgrounds with my freebie points. So, uh, it's gonna seem like a lot, but it's because I didn't up a lot of my attributes and uh, abilities. So I have Avatar 3, Backup three, resources four, arcane four, and destiny three, which I think came from Tyler, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you still read those, though. Yes. Um, and yes, you heard that right. Steve can call up a background crew of martial arts asking. Yes, I have. Hilarious! I love it. I have. I have ninjas at my disposal. Nice. Of course, you know. When we get to my flaws, that's gonna get even funnier. Actually, I thought about that. We're not gonna list all the merits and flaws. Some of that can stay secret until it just comes out. Oh! That'll be funny. Okay. Okay. As long as you all have your full lists from the side chats you all got. If not, we can go over that during the week. Okay. So those are my backgrounds, yeah. Um, I am actually quite rich and very secretive. Um, it's hard for anyone. Like, Arcane 4 makes me essentially like a myth um, in the world. If I remember that correctly. Yes. Ever. Gives you backwards. Alright. Not groove, just the ones I gave you or, or you picked. Um... Well, so Avatar is individual or group? The group Destiny. ones are the ones where... Those are all you. Group ones are all... Okay. The, I probably didn't even put them in your astro sheet for group. Okay. Um, Avatar, three dots. Destiny, three dots. Resources, at two. Fame, at two. Uh, one of the reasons is because of that uh, other job I have is sometimes underground fighting. Uh, Wins a lot. Apparently, it's almost supernatural. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Wait, what now? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, you want to fight? <laughs> you got a cage fight? <laughs> um, I have a little extra knowledge of history. I've got two dots in that. Um, I have an Nefandi lore at one dot. Oh, wait, did we all get that one? No. Okay. Yeah, I've gotten a fandy lore at one dot. Um, let's see, what else can I share with you guys? I so, so I will tell you some of my merits and flaws. So, oh no, we already... we're saving those. Oh, we want those oh, to be surprises, God. so that when they come up, everyone's like, "Why are you doing that?" Yes, oh. that part can be fun reveals. Oh, okay. <laughs> I. Don't they know one. I... They know about the wings. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's really all of my background stuff. Yep. I don't have much fanciness. 
in that. Eric. I think I've mentioned some already with the... Um, I have Avatar 5, Wonder 4, Destiny 3. Um, that's pretty much it. I didn't go too much into merits, and I figured I had enough of a big flaw to <laughs> not take any more of them. Um, I just settled on that. Now, Ever and Eric, you both had points and wonders. Ever, you have a serpent blade. This is a blade forged in the Dark Ages. The steel was imbued with dragon egg ore and perfected lead from alchemists at the time. Ooh. This means multiple things. One, it looks really badass. Two, you can describe what it looks like. But it was infused with dragon blood. Dragon egg. Uh, Serpent sword is what you call it? Yep. Did you say it doesn't dragon ring. Dragon egg ore? It was infused with the blade, yes. And perfected alchemical lead. Oh my. Uh, that, okay. th that's fine. <laughs> Don't ask questions. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Um, the blade is in a supernaturally dark, and it doesn't ring. Like if you can clang it, it doesn't do that ringy thing. Also, if you do dexterity plus melee difficulty seven, you can cut through matter and forces magic. What? It's a grass cutter. Yeah, and on a on a successful hit, it does one automatic lethal damage before you do any additional damage. So would normal you... sword damage plus one. Oh shit. Uh, would you mind sending me that in the side so I can copy and paste? Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of info. But I will wow. actually, we'll do that post show, yes. Okay. Eric. Mm -hmm. The Cross of Shame and Rebu Rebuke. Crafted by a southern preacher, this silver cross necklace was rolled out during the height of the American Civil Rights Marches of the 50s, taking the heart, the ideal, taking to heart the ideals of nonviolent protest begun by Gandhi and implemented further by Martin Luther King Jr. This wonder aids you in pursuit of that goal. When you're attacked, whether by stick or bullet or fire hose, the attacker is made to feel great shame. Moreover, it makes those around the attacker feel disgust towards the attacker. This is only if you're specifically targeted, not a group effect. In addition, it can banish entities antithetical to your particular faith. The power of the banishing, the exorcist one might say, depends on your true faith power. So basically, it's a mind two effect that causes the target to feel shame, and a secondary effect that instills disgust in the targets nearby. <laughs> Discourages attacking me. That's good. Yes. And is it you said the exorcism uh, cross? The power of Eric what, compels you. <laughs> but the uh, what it can dispel you said is uh, relevant only to the faith itself. So like, if it's like a you would have to believe God. it was from hell, right? Uh, okay, got it. All right. It would have to fit your paradigm, or else it won't work. Okay. It has a flaw because all wonders have flaws. Uh, gotcha. It only use when you have been directly harmed and only if you have not first attacked the harbor. So like if you punch a guy and get punched back, it doesn't work. <laughs> hmm. You don't have to be non-violent, but like, yeah. If the news punches the you, right, can't be the instigator. Gotcha. Uh, the flaw of your blade ever is that uh, for every round, so you can wield it for a number of turns equal to your uh, cunning. It's not cunning. Is it cunning in this game? No, it's called help. Not intellect, not perception, the other one. Wits. Wits. You can wield it for a number of turns equal to your wits. For every round after that that you wield it, uh, there's a chance, rolled by me, that uh, you will suffer dragon rage and go into berserker mode. Oh no! I only have <laughs> two dots and wits. Use it for two turns, put it away for a turn, pull it out again, you're fine. Okay. And you can break it up so it's not consecutive. The longer you hold it, the more it makes you feel like a dragon or you can't be killed, you're invulnerable, kill everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Harry, what you got? Uh, working on it. I totally forgot. Well, I can tell you the ones that I have so far. I've got five in resources, two, uh, then I have the powerful awakening thing. 
Which I don't know if that's a background, but I have that there in my sheet. What's up, Uh, what were they? Sorry. Uh, I had five in, uh, in resources. Yep. And then the uh, powerful awakening. Ooh. But I still got stuff to do because I'd, I is strong awakening. That's what it is. Is that a background or just I, I put that? That's there a merit. That's a merit. Okay, never mind. I need to. I know okay. you've got irritate a few, or not irritate. Wow, you've got avatar a few points, and I not have had yes, a lot of others. I will do that. Oh, status. You had status among the Order of Hermes mm -hmm. at a low level, enough to be pretentious about it. Okay, and Jared. Yeah. You uh, forgot a Rachel. I know you forgot me. How did I skip Rachel? I'm the you worst did. person ever. It's so okay, mean. I'll do Jared, then we'll, then we'll let it Rachel. Tisk, I'm not. Tisk. Wow, Tyler. Alright, so for me, I have uh, Avatar 3, Familiar 3, Status 3, um, Resources 1, my Destiny is 3, and then I have a Totem of 3. So I went heavy backgrounds, and then for my group background. Nope, not under this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about those? Okay. But yeah. Um, I would say the biggest one is I would say status. And it's not, I'd say no one would be status in terms of like famous, but status within the dream speakers and my uh, tribal family that I have. There's a little bit of a, uh, yeah. So. I'm well known through that area. And Rachel. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I have my uh, one dot familiar, my emotional support coyote, who I've decided to name Fotia, which is the Greek word for fire. Uh, I also have uh, resources four, alternate identity three, so I guess I'm a superhero. Awesome. I mean, those are very superhero backgrounds to have when they, when they come together. Um, I also have Avatar 2, uh, Dream 2, and Context 1, which um, uh, I don't think we ever defined, but it feels like it, it like the city's counterculture would be appropriate. Okay, you're muted, Tyler. I was hiding clicky noises on the keyboard, but yeah, counterculture is appropriate. Okay, cool. That was all of them? Uh, I believe so, yes. I, I didn't put any of my bonus XP into backgrounds. Okay. So, we probably won't actually start this session because we gotta talk about magic. It's just the part that matters the most, because nobody knows how that works. Mm. Well, most of you don't. Especially Steve, where every time it comes up, gives me the best blank look ever. So, first, focus, which was made up of your paradigm. Practice your tools. To reiterate, your paradigm is your belief system. It's how you view the universe. It's how it works in your head. Your practice is how you make the universe bend to your will. So, like, building on your belief you do these physical actions in the world to make change happen, supernatural change. Your tools are the props you use specifically to help focus your intention, your energy, and your brain. All three working together are focus. So, uh, this thing just jumped on me, sorry, hold on. Okay. Belief is the core of your focus. It's your paradigm. It reflects the way you think about the world and your place in it. It's the things that you believe help you spin the world to what you want. Your practice is the shape of your focus. Practice, of course, meaning to make or to do. So guided by your beliefs, you do your magic through the practice. Also, it's practical. Turning abstract ideas into useful activities. Tools other ways you physically focus yourself to do those things. Does that make sense to everyone? I forgot the third one. You said uh, paradigms. Tools. What was the other one? 
Uh, paradigm is your belief system. Practice is how you manifest your beliefs physically. Tools are how you focus yourself when manifesting your beliefs. Okay. So anytime we do a spell, I'm going to make you define... Sometimes I'll ask why you think it would work, but only at the beginning to get used to doing magic. And then later on, I will always make you tell me how. What does it look like? Do you chant? Do you dance? Do you sing? And then what tools are you using? That's why you all have three favorite tool sets and a practice and a, and a paradigm. We'll save that for next session. When we start slinging spells, we'll stop and let the audience know what your belief system is as we go. Uh, that's the fluff bit, the abstract. The hardcore mechanics. Everybody open your cool little spell card. My brother has created a spell card for us. It's an extension in Chrome. It's pretty awesome. Unless you're Steve. It's really cool. And you're sure it's infected your computer. I don't like the fact that it's on my computer, and I want to delete it immediately. <laughs> Chrome extension. I can download Chrome now. Yeah, the instructions, if you miss an area, are in the main, the main room. Not the prep room, the other room. The main game room. You got a bunch of screenshots. It's pretty simple, though. It's just installing. You have to go into developer mode, and then you install it on the pack. <laughs> yeah. So, card looks daunting. It's really not. The way it works is, and I'm going to go over some of this individually, but we'll break it out. Starting from the left, you would pick the sphere you're using and the level, the highest sphere used in the spell. Not all of them, just whatever's highest. So, like, if it's a mind forces effect and you need mind three and forces two, you would change mind to three. Nothing else. Uh, data and dimensional science don't apply to you. This card is also technocracy. Uh, the reason that matters, and now we're coming back to Eric asking about why doing them in your secret house would still get paradox. Because instead of paradox being uh, blatant magic in front of sleepers, instead now it's potency of the magic done. A subtle magic spell has a default difficulty of the highest sphere plus three. So if it requires forces three, your default difficulty is six. It's a subtle effect. Like shorting out the electricity in the building that can be written off real easy. Subtle effects are things that are easily written off by the way the world works normally. Uh, you only get paradox on that if you botch. Next up is uncanny. Uncanny things, they can still happen, but you know, there could be an Iron Man suit out there. Probably not. Uh, that's higher sphere plus four for your base difficulty. And you will gain one point of paradox automatically, plus more if you botch. A lot more if you botch. And then last but not least is extreme. So I'll explain those using Harry as an example in a second. Extreme is the base difficulty is high sphere use plus five, so yes. The base difficulty for a forces master creating a nuclear blast is ten before you start subtracting bonuses. Plus two points of automatic paradox, and on a botch, oh so much paradox. <laughs> paradox every three points will affect your essence and your aura and make the world weird for you and make people notice you. When you hit 15 points, it will backlash and be real bad. And we'll roleplay and we'll get into that the first time it happens. So, Harry wants to flick a lighter and turn it into the amount of flame that would come out of a flamethrower. That could happen. Butane could leak in and go right out the top. That's subtle. Harry wants to flick the lighter, grab the fire, and flick it at Steve. That's uncanny. That's not easy. If Harry wants to grab the fire, fling it at Steve, and have it explode like a nuclear fireball, that's extreme. If Harry wants to make it go from a sunny day to a rainy day, that's subtle. From rainy to stormy is also subtle. From rainy to hurricane, it's not so subtle. <laughs> Questions? That's why the first thing you choose on the spell card is the highest sphere rank, because it's setting the base DC. Next is Magical Feats. This is for a spell that doesn't have a specific intention. If Harry wants to burn for specific damage, he's not going to use Magical Feats. He's going to use the damage level. Right? So this is for, like, prestidigitation. Harry wants to set himself on fire and dance around but not burn. That's a Magical Feat. 
So for that, the difficulty of defeat is selected and it modifies the final spell DC. Same thing for correspondence being level of connection, damage being how bad, you, how hard you want to hit, duration. Most things are instant, but not everything. If you want it to last, uh, feats of illusion for when you're messing with someone's mind, feats of time forever. How far you're messing with time, whenever gets real powerful and wants to reset the whole game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, those are all the ones. I can do that. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> It'll never go the way you want it to, though. But that's how you affect the the spell casting based on what the spell does. Now, getting into. Uh, things you do, not things the spell is doing. We're looking at tools and rituals. Next session, because we won't have time tonight, we're all going to... The first thing we'll do is create one personalized instrument for each of you in your primary spheres. You always get to click that for your primary sphere. Personalized instruments are hard. They are one of a kind, unique, and special to you all at once. A unique instrument is one of a kind, but not necessarily special to you. So, like, Eric's Cross could be a personalized instrument. But, like, a splinter of the cross would be a unique instrument that I personalized. Unique and specialized means it's also one of a kind, but also specifically made by other wizards for magic, for one specific kind of magic. Like a Harry Potter wand. Unique and specialized. Unfamiliar instruments means you need to cast a spell, but you can't use any of the three instrument categories you picked select that or you want to try something new to bring it into your paradigm to increase it you click that the first few times until you get used to it it hurts to do things at the early stage using instruments when not needed uh, all of you except maybe Harry read the example of the one finger punch that's not going to come up much in Mage of the Ascension ultimately when you gain super high level knowledge spheres you realize the tools are just how you manifest your will, but at the end of the day, you're just willing it to happen. So eventually, you can toss those tools out the window, right? It's just you making reality change. Bruce Lee can do a one-finger punch and break a board. You've seen him do it from, like, this far away. He hits it and the board breaks, right? Most of you probably seen that. Not many people in the world can do that. You might be able to train yourself enough to break boards, period. Then you may even be able to train yourself to break boards from close range, but you probably spend your whole life trying to figure out how to break a board with one finger from an inch away. And even if you did figure that out, now break the board just by looking at it. Yeah, you're probably never getting rid of your instruments. <laughs> so, but if it ever comes up, that's why that's there. Uh, personal item from the target is traditional things you're thinking here, nails, special item important to them. Uh, appropriate and opposed resonance. Some areas have an aura to them. We all know a haunted house feels creepy. Uh, the science lab in your school doesn't feel the same as the gym. That's resonance. It's appropriate to what you're trying to do or oppose those kick in. Hyper narrative. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know what that's for. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it a couple times. I don't get it. Uh, time and effort. Spending quintessence. You all will have that. We're going to touch on it in a second. Spending Quintessence brings the DC down one for one. You spend as many points as you have. Spending extra time makes magic easier. Do rituals, but especially at the early levels, do rituals a lot. Fast casting is real bad. That means you got to do it on the fly in one turn in a fight. Good luck, kid. You're probably going to get shot. And then, of course, turning time backwards. The general circumstance category. Uh, first one's obvious. Near a node node is a supernatural wellspring of quintessence you'll have one in your base it's going to be handy for at home rituals uh, distance mean when it says distant or hidden target it means real far away like california to new york distance uh, juggling several effects at once means you have active spells you're concentrating that also automatically applies distracted mage in conflict with your avatars means that your avatar is giving you advice and you're not listening that might happen to Eric a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> domino effort means you're team working the ritual. And then outlandish to godland, let's see, obviously. 
last but not least, on the far right, roll play bonuses. Uh, you set your Arate level because Arate is your spellcasting dice pool. That's it, period, end of story, Doug. Unless you spend your awareness, you're only ever going to roll Arate for a spell dice pool. Everything else only modifies uh, difficulty. Yeah. Hard to cast spells. So, like, I'm going to tell you, you need six successes. You're never going to do it in one turn. It's just that simple, at least not at this level. Uh, willpower, spend a willpower, get an uh, automatic success, just like anything else, but only one per turn. Bonus die, uh, that's in there because I asked Nathan to put it there, just in case it ever comes up. DC adjustments, the same thing for stuff that unexpected things that come up in any role playing game. Procedures are for technocrats. Thus is your spell card. There's a lot of things there, but you'll find out you're only going to click two or three any one spell. Maybe four or five on a big group spell. And then it will roll the dice and it will tell you success is remaining, how you're doing, if you fail and need to spend willpower to rescue the spell, botch. Because math is dumb. So, uh, magic terms that I just threw at you on the spell card. Uh, Avatar and Arate. Arate is bouncing around everywhere in this PDF, let me tell you. Arate is uh, the core of your magic and how excellent you are at it. You're always striving for perfect excellence. Uh, every faction, every individual mage will disagree about it, what it actually is. No one really knows. But it's how good you are at doing magic and how connected your soul is to the magic. It's your inner deeds. The Akashayana would probably call it harmony with the way. Whereas Rachel would probably call it breaking my mind in flesh prison. But mm -hmm. it's just a word to reference how good you are at doing magic. It's really it. Uh, it requires XP to raise, but going beyond five dots also requires my approval got to advance your character and role play not just points you must have understanding to advance your understanding goes to 10 uh, quintessence or I'm sorry avatar is your awakened self your soul is awakened depending on how high your dots and avatar are like at one or two dots it's just things happen around you the world guides you in a certain direction you see signs and omens three and four dots it talks to you five dots it's like your best friend that's always there it's your it's your imaginary best friend that isn't imaginary and even the other pages around you might be able to see here at five it's also kind of a dick at that level <laughs> uh i will role play it when it matters it will talk to you it will drive you it'll yell at you it'll try to guide you towards what your inner self thinks you should be doing it doesn't mean that's what your outer self thinks you should be doing also each point of avatar is how much quintessence you can hold in your pattern, unless you have prime three or higher. Look at you, Eric. Uh, at less than prime three, you can only ever hold that much quintessence equal to your avatar at any one time. You just can't handle it to burn you up. Prime three or higher, you can basically hold an unlimited amount if you roll the spell. Uh, those two things together determine your awakening and how aware you are of the world. Quintessence is magical energy, essentially, that you can eat or hold inside your uh, supernatural self that lets you make spellcasting easier. That's what it is. Also, you feed your familiars with it, and you have to charge your magic items with it. That's why you all got a group note. Uh, spheres. Does anyone have any questions about any of the spheres? Like, so, just have a base idea of what they mean is what I'm looking for here. Oh, I know what they mean, but, like, as far as spending freebie points, we can spend them on spheres, right? No. Or not, spheres or and, dots. You cannot no, buy okay. sphere dots with freebies. You only get six. That's because okay. Okay. I want everyone to start low so that we can get So freebies to are just uh, attributes, abilities, backgrounds? Willpower and Arate. You can raise your Arate up to a max of three with your back with your freebies. 
It's your Arate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want that history if you can get it, which would be eight points of your freebies. Oh, it's already at three. Hmm. Oh, yeah. We probably talked about that, and I forgot. Or one of us forgot. We did talk about your okay. backgrounds at one point. <laughs> so, yeah, already at three assumes you spent eight of those 20 points, meaning you have 12 left. Hmm. Also, willpower will never be cheaper than it is right now. It's one freebie for one willpower. When you raise it with XP, it's current rating times two. So, like, to go from 7 to 8 is, like, 15 XP or something. Crazy. Yeah, it's mean. Yeah, so yeah. I can max out my willpower? Could if you wanted to. Yeah, Eric yeah. always does. Okay, would I just not, did. Would not it's be a bad only move. two for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the few games that I've played this, like, with technocracy and stuff, it was like, you should have at least seven, like, minimum. Yeah. A mage starts at five. I, I always say to no less than seven with a mage because mages are supposed to be will workers. Right. <laughs> it's the whole point. Um, oh, I only have six. This will be no. fun. No. Still better than five. Better than the default. Okay. Mm -hmm. For reference, human average in World of Darkness is four. Mm, okay. Uh, so yeah, spheres will obviously get into in future sessions, but you have a basic idea of how they work. Dot wise, level one is sense and defend the self. Two is small effects on the self in the environment. Three is bigger effects on the self, small effects on others. Four is perfection on the self in the environment, and major effects on others, and five is faster. They actually go to nine. Getting over five is hard, but you can do such things. <laughs> uh, and that leads to paradox. At that juicy 15 paradox point value you'll all get to eventually, your paradox will backlash. I roll dice, the form takes either physical damage or mental damage or a combination of both. It literally burns your body or it wrecks your mind or it does a little of both. Wrecking a mage's mind is called descending into quiet. Rude. Temporary mage insanity. It will pull the party in and you all have to help that person escape their own internal madness. It would be amazing. Mm. Some aspect of themselves that was connected to that spell that they have never resolved they get pulled into it and they're stuck in a loop and you have to help pull them out and if you're not there that's real fun then they're just drooling staring off into space to you like what's going on <laughs> or if you take too much mental damage you can become a marauder which is a mage who has gone permanently into quiet and everything around you bows to the whims of what you believe is happening Hmm. So if you thought uh, you were Don Quixote in it as a marauder, the whole world would turn into his book. All the so people would incredible. get pulled into it and think that's normal, including you other mages. Uh, very on, dangerous. on the mage Facebook group, uh, they have cited WandaVision as like, it's a marauder! Yes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> very much stuck in quiet, the entirety of that show, yeah. That's, huh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Exactly what that is, is mage quiet, yep. So, that's magic. The only other thing we had to go over was getting better. But basically, that just means spending XP, and we can throw that chart up next week because we're right out of time right now. Perfect. So, we'll go over XP next week. We'll go over the other thing we missed. Harry needs a wonder because he just spent points on yes, a wonder. Yes, I've decided to spend a stupid amount of points, but don't worry about coming up with one now if that's <laughs> difficult. Just, you know. I'll pick a good one. And then uh, we will also go over the Miskatonic Hollow, ho hollow which we are in the Masks and Mythos of Zion. That's the region you'll be playing in. That'll be fun. Miskatonic Hollow and Boston. You need a city in the world of darkness. Excited. Very. So. Sucks. I won't be here next week. No. Yeah. Is that next week? Yep, that's seventh. You'll, you'll you'll be out running naked with the wolves for the first session. Yep, that's what I'm gonna be doing. Like in real life? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that's a cool reason to miss. Yeah, I'm for it. Oh jeez. Oh no! Oh no! Hold on. Oh no! What? What? What do we do? I didn't put the outro song in here. I need to fix that. Right what did you do? 
Why'd you break it? Can't not have an outro song. Quick, ever, drop an outro beat. Oh, I got this. I got plenty. I just <laughs> gotta I, add one I to it. I dropped the, oh, the beat fell. Oh, Crap, dang. I'm sorry. And got it. Good to go. Okay. Well, Seekers, I heard the screams from the cellar where hidden stairs take us to Inferno. We smelled the blood and burnt flesh from those sacrifices to long forgotten gods and saw glimpses from beyond the veil, but now we must return to the fitful slumber of the blind until next week when we will return to White Walls. We thank you for journeying, journeying with us. Hope to see you again next week. Don't forget to click follow here on Twitch. And if you go to YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell. We appreciate you all. Special thanks tonight to our Patreons, especially Dave, Don Arnetto, and Funky Thunder. Love you guys. Thanks to all our Twitch subscribers as well. You guys help make our quality better, our cosplay sharper, and help us feed all the cats and dogs. So many. So many. Thanks also to Helm Gas, Onyx Path, Publishing, White Wolf, and Modiphius for the setting. It's an awesome games. And Dark Somnium Music, Darren Curtis Music, Savic Music, and Helm Gas. For many of the tunes and beats you heard in this episode. Awaken Seekers of Enlightenment, tell us who you are. And the next time, people can find you on Horrible Tales and elsewhere. That's me. Hi, I am Steve. Um, you will find me on these nights playing Drake Jones, but also I will be back tomorrow um, to play Scion Dragon with some awesome people, which will be fun. Uh, you forgot. Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. It's not Monday. My brain just melted. I will be back tomorrow to play Cyberpunk, which I'm extremely excited for. Jonesing, we missed a week. It's I terrible. am. We missed a week, and so I'm like super excited for it. Jump right back into Cyberpunk. Um, other than that, find me on the internet at Voodoo Arcade, doing not very good on the internet. Thank you. I don't know. I, I think you're doing all right on the internet. I mean, you're internetting. Yeah, jeez. But anyway. Hey everybody, I have been not my character yet, but I will be. So, my name's Ever, pronouns are they, them. You can find me on the internet as Changeling Ever. And you can find me tomorrow night being Vector for Cyberpunk Red. You can also swing by Etsy and check out my Etsy shop that currently has slim pickings till I restock and make new designs. Neat. As in, those are really neat glasses you got at the thrift store because, you know, recycling. Uh, wow, I lost track of what I was saying. Neat and code designs. There we go. Those are called, I did time magic and wrecked the game. Deal with it. it <laughs> truth. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Maron Recluse. And uh, tomorrow I'll be here for a Star Wars Aren't you GMing it? Yes, that is correct. Uh, hello, my name is Rachel. Uh, you can find me Stolen Fires pretty much everywhere. Uh, next shows I'm going to be on on Thursday. I'm going to be running Changeling the Dreaming on the Onyx Path channel. Uh, Harry is a player in that game. It's a lot of fun. He's decided he to pick fights. problems. So, uh, ha has any of this sort of like, oh, these are the assholes I picked a fight with? <laughs> these are the gentle benign ones compared to yours. <laughs> Yeah, uh, anyway, uh, the changeling just decided to pick a fight with the technocracy, but, I mean, that was coming because changelings, technocracy, that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so, so they not like each other? Yeah. To be fair, changelings I soloed are... two werewolves, so I think I have okay chances. Changelings are second only to tradition mages for reality deviants, the technocracy must purge. Mm-hmm. Because the weird is very potent. Uh... But, uh, yeah, so that's Onyx Path channel that airs, uh, 9.30, uh, Thursday nights, Eastern Time. Uh, I also play on Plastic Age Plays, but, uh, that is gonna be delayed a couple weeks. I also have a really cool project, uh, that I was uh, an editor and writer on, uh, Mora Cinematic Universal Role-Playing Game. It's really cool. Uh, the part that I wrote was a game setting called Punching Nazis. Guess what that's about? Yeah. I wanna play it. <laughs> Awesomeness. It's it's really good. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a very simple cinematic system. Uh, it's hitting Kickstarter in the spring. I'm so excited. Yeah. We'll have to play test it. 
Uh, I, I would happily run a punch and <laughs> you, you guys. Yes. It's, oh my it's, God, a, yeah. weir it's a Weird War 2 fantasy setting. Oh, that's fun. Oh. So, uh, instead, so we've got night witches who are actual witches, mm -hmm. uh, so dragon nice. aces who are fighter pilots riding dragons, it's actual Dope. super soldiers if you want to be Captain America. Yeah. I am so in on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's me. Dope. I love it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Harry underscore Wyckoff. Uh, I'm on this channel uh, on Wednesdays for Infinity and on Saturdays for Deviant. Um, and for this, uh, you can also find me with Rachel on Onyx Path and at Salubri Cat on YouTube, where I do a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah, take care, people. All right. And now, normally we do votes. However, we didn't get any playing in, which means I'm giving you all a vote. Oh. Votes in this game from the audience are worth the following. Uh, one bonus willpower to spend in a future session without actually spending the willpower point. Cast your votes, however. Do any one of the following three things. Restore one point of quintessence that you spent. No. Not to go beyond your max available. Restore one spent point of awareness, or restore one spent point of stability. On any session that is a book close, instead, when you vote for each other as players, straight up one XP, or split for a half to two people. So, you all get one regular uh, vote tonight to be spent to restore contestants' willpower or uh, stability when next needed. All right, and now we must return the cast and the viewers to their restless sleep until next week. Good night. Good night. Night, people. Good night. Yeah, good night.